Hello, hello everyone and welcome at our next installment of Armchair Admiral stream. Uh, today we will be having a slightly different lineup than the last time. Uh, for one, uh, Prince Blip unfortunately cannot join us. Uh, he had to uh, drop out at the last minute. Uh, and uh, Mr. Drachenifel is, uh, as far as I know, uh, busy... Uh, with uh, some uh, medieval stuff uh, in uh, somewhere in Britain. So I'm looking forward to uh, some uh, nice pictures from there because uh, he has a very nice suit of uh, full plate armor. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's always fun to go to some uh, different uh, time period. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, we have uh, two guests today with, uh, with us. One is running slightly late, but uh, for now, uh, let's jump to guest number one. And uh, after some time, it's my pleasure to welcome again uh, Wesley Lifesey. Uh, hello, it's it's good to be back again after our Jutland discussion from a few months ago. Yes, and uh, I mean, uh, in a way, this discussion will be kind of a uh, also touching Jutland a lot, probably because uh, today's topic. S some, yeah, something tells me the the word Jutland is going to be used several times over the next couple hours. Yes. Uh, oh, uh, Decool seventy one. This is the first armchair Edmos without Drakenifel. Yes, that's true. This is the very first time without him. Uh, and yes, uh, the Battle of Jutland was, I say, uh, probably the highlight of the battle cruisers, both how to use them and how probably not to use them. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, they are they are kind of interesting class. And uh, I mean, is there a an easy way how to define what a battle cruiser is. I mean, apart from um, the nice summary that you've provided that we uh, should keep for the end. But uh. yeah, yeah, you know, I think I think it is certainly a challenge. And you know, seeing the questions um, that have been uh, submitted for this armchair admirals, I think the definitional question of what is or is not a battle cruiser is something that is certainly alive and well, yes. 115 years after their introduction. Yeah, like, uh, I mean, we we have a lot of candidates of potential battle cruisers of ships that were battle cruisers. We have even real life examples of ships that started out as battle cruisers and then turned out into something else. And uh, ships that uh, maybe were started in the like uh, design phase as, phase as battle cruisers, but they were not in the end. So, like, uh, yeah, it's it's hard to exactly pin down, and uh, that's I guess why there is so much, uh, so much discussion. Uh, so I think I can switch to uh, actually a quick overview of uh, where did they come from. Uh, as you can see, uh, Doctor Clark is uh, still not uh, in the call. He will be in soon. TM. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's go. So, 
I mean, yeah, I, I can talk is... a little bit about this if yeah. you'd like. Yeah. So if, cool. if we look at kind of the the introduction of battle cruisers, um, so um, in uh, let me pull up my notes here before I start throwing out dates and stuff. <laughs> so the the dreadnought was introduced in 1906. Of course, the dreadnought is not a battle cruiser. Um, but along with that, there were other major new evolutions of ship design that would be introduced by the Royal Navy in, in those years after 1906. Um, one of these was the battle cruiser. Um, now, the battle cruiser is interesting because it's really built around two purposes, and it's all a reaction to other ships that were afloat at the time that it was introduced. The, the first purpose is to act as fleet scouts for the battle fleet. You see this happening a lot in the First World War. It happens at Jutland, where BD and his battle cruisers are out in front trying to find the German fleet so that the Grand Fleet can engage it in hopefully a fight to the death. Along with that, the other purpose was to kind of be... Uh, maybe both. <laughs> <laughs> um, True. Uh, and the other purpose was around commerce raiding. They were designed to be kind of the apex predators of the open ocean when it came to commerce raiding and also defending British trade from commerce raiders. Essentially, they were given a lot of speed, but big guns. And to make that happen, they had to compromise on stuff like armor. Now... If you want to see a really good example of the commerce raiding aspect of a battle cruiser, check out the Battle of the Falkland Islands that happens in late 1914, where two battle cruisers essentially wipe out um, Von Spee's squadron um, at the Battle of the Falkland Islands. And uh, now, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would say that's uh, probably. Uh, more like anti-commerce raiding, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, to protecting, you know, from, from armored cruisers of, yeah. of Germany or any other yeah. nation was one yeah, of their primary uh, purposes. Yeah, speaking of armored cruisers, that's uh, where I've actually started because mm, they are perfect. they play also important role in the entire evolution. So here's a very, very quaint uh, 1870s armored cruiser. I believe 1870s. As you can see, it's uh, it fits the bill. It uh, has a armored belt. It has uh, some guns, and it was designed for ship for things that the ships of the line were not necessarily. Uh, but obviously, with the outcome of uh, with the income of turrets, uh, ah, I think someone's joining. Maybe, maybe ah, yes. Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear us? Is that working? It seems to be working. Optimistically. Uh, I will just have to uh, fiddle with the volume levels, but that's okay. I will do it right now. Uh, yeah. So, uh, just uh, to switch to our second guest. Hello and uh, welcome. Uh, uh, let's say by this time uh, one of the regulars, uh, Dr. Cl uh, Alexander Clark. Uh, welcome to the Armchair Admirals and uh, well, thank you for coming by and also thank you for a gift that uh, was delivered to me from London. What's that? And oh, that's... Can you, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> uh, oh. So uh, the gift is the famous Iron Brew. <laughs> now I have to admit that I never actually, or maybe once had Iron Brew in my lifetime. So uh, this is a world premiere of me drinking it. So if there is a case of Iron Brew poisoning, well, well. It's been nice knowing you. Yeah. Sorry for being late. Uh, no problem. Uh, apart from the Iron Brew, actually, I wanted to ask you, because unfortunately, uh, Mr. Conway is uh, not present today and I didn't have anyone to ask. Uh, we also got from London uh, a book. Uh, ah. Cruisers of World War II. So... Uh, I'm investigating who did it actually come from. <laughs> I don't. Uh, it was 
I can't remember who actually put it down. Um, it's... Mm. That okay, is a very so well-used copy. There was a yes. very nice gentleman who was putting that, who was giving the book out about... I was giving off the, over the Iron Brew, which Drac uh, nicked a bottle of. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I dropped off a pack of four bottles. I'm not sure how many have actually reached you. Uh, the, some did, yes. More <laughs> than one. Uh, but okay, uh, so for the for the book, I will have to investigate uh, with uh, Mr. Conway once he's uh, back in the office. Uh, cool, I will do that. I have my suspicion. And if that suspicion is ri uh, right, uh, thank you, Mr. Sailing Hamster. And if not, then, well, thanks uh, to the unknown... Uh, <laughs> Uh, unknown donator, and we will. Uh, I, I'll make sure that uh, you become known, and uh, that I can send something nice your way. I, I uh. will just admit the reason I'm running late is because my university, which I was teaching at today, decided to lock out all my access, so all my students' grades got lost. So I was frantically putting some extra grades up and sorting things out, and then went, "Oh, sugar, I'm ten minutes late." So uh, did Did you manage to get all the grades? All the grades are in. Students, ah, the students cool. will not be unhappy. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, this is the I think more important than our uh, stream, as much as it pains uh, me to tell it. So uh, good that uh, everything is sorted out. Uh, so, uh, so uh, welcome anyway again. And uh, today's topic: battle cruisers. Uh, we started with a short historical introduction, so I'll switch back to the nice pretty pictures of an uh, armored cruiser, actually. So basically, the yeah, armored cruiser, a uh, few big guns, a uh, few medium guns, few small guns, armored belt, armored deck, uh, all the bells and whistles, faster than battleships. Well, until the dreadnought came. They were, and, and they were useful. Yes, and uh, here's actually the, the let's say, the, the pinnacle of the armored cruiser, right? The Blücher. Definitely. It is, it, it's sometimes listed off with the battle cruisers, because by the time it enters services, everyone's talking about battle cruisers. And to an extent, the poor Germans got fooled by Jackie Fisher and his flair for words, because he built the Invincible class as Dreadnought Armoured Cruisers and they and the poor Germans weren't quite sure what that meant <laughs> and they ended up producing Blücher and he of course produced the Invincibles which were not Invincible but they were pretty to an extent and oh. this is the thing with the armor cruisers. There is a transition between them to battle cruisers, but they're also their armor cruisers linger on. And it's one of the interesting things is that you get as you closer you get to the 1930 uh, late 1930s in World War II, all the navies are sort of looking at roughly a cruiser of roughly 20,000 tons, which isn't real. Is either where a pr true heavy cruiser would have grown to without the treaties. Or is where the armoured cruisers might have ended up by about that time. And it's a case of, well, yes, the, the, the trouble is, we can now make a battleship fast enough that you don't really need a battle cruiser. You don't really need a battle cruiser, i.e. a battleship which is as fast as a cruiser, or rather a cruiser which has a battleship's guns, but is never going to fight another ba a battleship because that's a bad thing. But we do need something which is a something below a battleship or a battle cruiser, but bigger than the other cruisers because there are things going around the world we need to be able to engage. And also, it makes nice if you can have something fast like that as your principal carrier escort, etc. So you don't have to have the battleships going on because you know you don't need a fast battleship to escort an aircraft carrier if they're lovely the aircraft carrier is never going to complain it's sort of a case of yeah you seen me this is my bodyguard and it's it's kind of like when you see those very small pop stars they're usually female but there are a few male ones i.e harry styles who are titchy and they have enormous bodyguards well, I mean, uh, you know, the same goes for uh, Napoleon's uh, grenadiers, right? 
Yes, uh, pretty much. Although Napoleon wasn't quite as small as sometimes well, yeah. out to be. But, you know, it, enormous people. That's the battleship going along. Basically, uh -huh. consider the uh, armoured cruiser, sort of 20,000 ton cruiser, uh, more like, I don't know, your former SAS, slightly smaller, slightly slighter gentleman, uh, but no less deadly and, frankly, probably... It's quite. It's far easier to fit him in a dry dock. Even though I, I mean the later. Uh, apparently, the issue uh, was uh, not uh, you being too quiet, but me being too loud. Uh, I guess. Uh, uh, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, I mean, unless I'm mistaken, the late uh, armored cruisers were actually kind of comparable with the in size with the Predator not battleships, right? Oh, they were. And that's also something else which is quite common in history. Cruisers are often as big as the battleships. In fact, often they're bigger because the battleship just has to turn up and pelt away at you. The cruiser has to find you, be able to get away from you and get the information back to the battle fleet. Or alternatively, has to spend its time finding you and then taking you out because you're, you're hunting down your commerce. So the cruisers are often... At at various points in history, cruisers are bigger than battleships. And if you've ever seen, there's a classic picture from about the 1930s, which has two Queen Elizabeth class and two county class cruisers. Two Queen Elizabeth class battleships. And two... You look at them and you, from the picture, you could be excused for thinking the counties are bigger, as in longer, than the Queen Elizabeths. They do look that big lengthwise on. In that picture. And that's not unsurprising. That's what a cruiser is designed to do. It's made li it's made slightly lighter. It's made with slightly more spaces in its hull. So slightly less subdivision. So it can carry more fuel. So it can carry more supplies. So it can go around the world and find out where the opponent is. So one of the reasons why you don't need battleships to have so much fuel. Because if your cruisers have enough fuel, they'll find the enemy. If your battleships don't have enough fuel, well, the enemy tends to come to them anyway. That's what the German high seas fleet and the Rager Marina in World War II proved. Uh, actually, I will uh, quickly cheat here. Even though... Oh, how am I going to do it? I will have to switch it manually in the OBS. No. No. Damn it. Okay, I, I will not cheat. I will not show what I wanted to show. Uh, but I actually managed to find a very nice picture of uh, a war spite in the county class at uh, Malta. And uh, yeah, the, yeah, the size difference is quite clear there. And uh, the, I mean, come to think of it, the, the towns were also quite big for for that. Yes, the, the towns were also quite big. Although uh, it, it does get into interesting conversations when you start going to the towns because you start going, well... The Royal Navy's technically building a, what they're they're building as an anti-surface uh, a, a surface radar surface vessel, but that means it has all the capabilities of a surface radar. And then you look at what they keep doing to the Japanese with it, i.e., the Asamamaru incident and various other things, and you're going. So plucking a merchant liner out of the ocean, not far off the coast of Japan, just to get some German sailors merchant sailors off it um yeah that sounds pretty surface raidery to me not sure wesley what do you think i, I would say that falls under the category but <laughs> I, I bet you could find an explanation for why it wasn't I, I, i'm sure they, the royal navy the royal navy never do surface raiding do they <laughs> of course not of course not obviously that ship might have had contraband you know yes, it had to stop it, it it. It had some German sailors aboard it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I believe that uh, this proud tradition was also displayed by some uh, US Navy ships. I believe one of the German blockade runners in World War II was uh, held up under the pretext of a suspicion of being engaged in slave trade and basically then bogged down in the uh, legalities until the US entered the war. So. Yeah, it, it's amazing what you can find when you start looking at some of the old laws. They are some really interesting things. You can find an entire treaty which allows you to have access to Portugal's islands without involving them in a war. 
And ah, here's the picture actually that uh, hey! you were talking about, probably. Yeah, yes. And as you can see, they don't exactly look that small, do they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they, they, they were big boats. And those are 10, well, theoretically 10,000 ton cruisers. Let's be honest, the British included water as armor and um, the counties as Drac would be saying, no doubt if he was here, they have amazingly slotted in armor, which appears from nowhere, which gets magically slotted in between 1937 and 1940. And suddenly every county has a full belt. Well, miracles do happen. Uh, every yeah. treaty cruiser comes with an asterisk, right? Of like, <laughs> yeah, they, somebody somewhere claimed this was 10,000 tons. Yeah, it, it, it's like sort of, I, I it's my critique of, and um, we should be, we will should talk about it some point, in the fact that the Royal Navy are considering a battle cruiser design in, instead of Nelson and Rodney. And it would have been a very interesting idea. But what they could have done, and what I maintain they should have done, is just as they were building Nelson and Rodney with all the guns forward and all the engines aft anyway, just put in space for eight extra boilers and make sure they have the turbines that can take them. And then when it comes to war, just double the horsepower. Just add in the boilers, turbine, uh, get, give more power to the turbines, more steam, more horsepower, and then poor Nizer now, which was a fast battleship, not a battle cruiser, would have had a panic attack, which would have actually ended with it not living, because Rodney and Rodney would not have been limited to twenty-five knots. Uh, theoretically, they got her up to by shaking engine and everything else, <laughs> um, I, uh... chasing her, poor Nizer now down. It would have probably been getting up to twenty-eight, thirty knots. At which point, poor Nizer now is probably going. Um, you have sixteen-inch guns. And um, I am currently equivalently stationary. Um, I'm not getting out of this one. Uh, this is a great point. And really, I think like the the idea of expansion slots for engines in naval vessels is not nearly explored enough in designs. Yeah, it's the <laughs> easiest. It, it's the, the and you sit there and go, you're going for something. It's far more complicated adding in armor. Let's be honest, into a county class, than it would have been just building a, a Nelson and Rodney with a little bit more space. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, actually, uh, to return a bit back uh, from Dropsweth uh, on the YouTube comment, it's not surface raiding vessel, it's an anti contraband <laughs> and smuggling vessel. Precisely. Yes. Precisely. Yes. There's a nice legal yeah. phrase away for it. Uh, but uh, yeah, in any case, we have uh, these uh, huge uh, and uh, pretty well armed armored cruisers, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I mean, the German ones went up to 21 centimeter guns. The British had uh, 9.2 inch guns, right? Uh, what does it translate into metric, actually? That's uh, 9.2 inch times t uh, that's that times would be 2. like 5, so that's... 230. Yeah, something. Uh, then you have uh, some nations prefer their armored cruisers uh, with uh, smaller guns, but a lot of them. Uh, I believe the Americans took that uh, approach with a lot of six-inch guns in the later upgrades. It basically After the depends initial... on your reading of history. It's your reading of history. Do you think what your engagements are going to be won by uh, getting close and firing very, very fast? Or do you think your engagements are going to be won at medium distances or, you know, and long range engagement? And it's as the technology grows. One of the things that's often misappreciated about the Dreadnought era is that it's actually the cruisers which are driving a lot of the developments in long range gunnery. Because the idea was still very much up until about, ooh, probably 1903, 4, even after Cunaberti's paper. The idea very much was the battleships were going to get close and smash each other to pieces with their heavy ar uh, their gun. And the, the ships which were gonna, Yes, the ships which were going to be in running engagements where they were going to be chasing people down and having to fire at long range were the cruisers. So in many ways, the cruisers going for all long range guns almost makes more sense than the battleships. 
strangely enough. Yeah. But uh, then, obviously, we have the problem that, like, if your enemy has armored cruisers and you have armored cruisers, they are kind of, like, usually similar designs, right? So, like, if you have an uh, engagement between them, it's not your guaranteed win. So, what do no. you do next? <laughs> bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bigger. It's just bigger. It's always filled bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, you know, one of those things that, uh, it, it, one of the counterintuitive things that happens in World War One is that everyone learns the legacy of World War One le- largely from the Battle of Jutland, that battle cruisers are weak and terrible and shouldn't be invested in. Royal Navy, the largest navy in the world at the end of World War One, fighting a war, they've got very pressing demands. What are the classes they're building? Well, then there's the Renana and Pulse. We're going to skip off courageous and hesitous because they're just annoying then it's the admiral class which are battle cruisers some say proto fast battleships but they are definitely designed at battle cruiser at a time and what's the next class the rn lays down the g3s which are also battle cruisers this uh, let's put it way of any navy they probably use battle cruisers the most in world war one and are the ones who are still able to build anything and they're building battle cruisers. So was there, was there a lesson from World War One that battle cruisers were not the things that you needed to win a war? Or was their idea that well we have a very strong battle fleet? What we need to think about though is control is not just commanding the oceans, it's controlling them. And to control the oceans, you need a battle cruiser. To command the oceans, you need a battle fleet. Because the battle cruiser goes around, and like Sturdy did at the Falklands, which is why I'm wearing a Falklands T-shirt and all sorts of other things. Battle cruisers were about ocean control, about making sure your trade got through, and the enemy's trade didn't, and the enemy's raiding squadrons preferably didn't. Um, yeah, I mentioned but- the Falkland Islands earlier, and it's like the. It's- I feel like that would be like the textbook example if you asked a fisher or, or whoever was involved in or whoever else was involved in the battle cruiser program to design like a textbook example of how you would use battle cruisers. They would probably talk about something like the Falklands Islands. Yeah. And if you um, consider what ha- would happen in World War Two, if you've got hunting when the RN's forming its hunting groups with its aircraft carriers, what's put into the hunting groups? The battle cruisers. Because what- they can keep up. They can keep up the carriers. And suddenly, that's a really effective hunting group for controlling your oceans. An aircraft carrier and a battle cruiser combined. That's a freaking mean thing coming up. Because you think about it. If you're a surface raider in 1939, 1940, the biggest and best of you is the Deutschland class. Uh, they ain't going to run outrun Renown, Repulse, and Hood. And if they've got an aircraft carrier with them, they're going to make sure that area is very, very monitored and secured. So that's going to make running away from them even more difficult, which is why they're off in the areas they're doing. You know, one, the great thing about the Deutschland is it's up in the North Atlantic where it should be getting the vast majority of trade, really having fun. A, Hitler has a panic attack because he just suddenly realizes that Deutschland is in the middle of the Royal Navy's hunting grounds and the Royal Navy's going... There is a, there is a pan, a panzer sheet, a heavy cruiser up here. Ooh, with eleven inch guns. I wonder what we have in the arsenal which will deal with eleven inch guns. Uh, well, we have some Queen Elizabeth class battleships which might catch it on a on a good day for them. We have uh, all those things are out there hunting them. So Deutschland gets withdrawn, and the Graf Bay is of course down south in the South Atlantic, which is a very rich area, dodging between there and the Indian Ocean but is far less target rich and is really not the critical area and it becomes far more critical after in after Italy enters the war and suddenly all the trade from the far east has to go round africa but when that happens there's suddenly a lot more how should i put this other ships turning up and also by that time poor graf spay has had the battle of the river plate where yeah. she was to, well whilst she was a beautiful heavy cruiser mm, uh she wasn't a match for a lightish heavy cruiser and 
to light cruisers. Uh, I mean, kind of my reading of that battle is that she kind of was a match, but uh, the entire like long range heavy raider concept was overlooking one very important detail that even relatively like damage that you would shrug off if it happened in the North Sea. Like you cannot really shrug it off when you are like half the globe away from the closest friendly port. So like even if she did win that engagement, she would be still damaged enough not to probably get back to Germany, right? Well, that I mean, is the problem. With that. that is yeah. the problem with the the whole surface raider concept yes. from the German perspective to start off with. But there's also the fact that you know she wasn't really going to see once she got into. Um... Oh, good lord! I've gone blank on the harbor name, Monteverdi. Yeah. Um, she uh, once she uh, once she's got in there, she's not going anywhere, and she couldn't get away from them. That's the point. You, as you can point out and can say, well, does she do it when uh, when does she? I think at best you can call that engagement a draw. But the fact yeah. is, the British are quite prepared to carry on engaging and are chasing her. And there is, of course, Cumberland coming up, which is probably the most unlucky cruiser in the Royal Navy. She is always 20 minutes away from getting to have the battle she wants. She has three run it close run runs with Graf Spey. Three at three different points in Graf Spey's journey. Spey's journey. She's within half a day of Cumberland, and they manage to miss each other completely. Neither realizes the other one's there. Poor Cumberland goes through the whole of World War Two. She's always racing to get to engagement and never quite getting there. It's cruelty. That's that's one unlucky ship. At least poor Rodney actually gets Bismarck. You know, Rodney misses out on Nisenhow because she takes off, but she gets Bismarck. She gets the consolation prize. I'm not sure if Bismarck would consider herself the consolation prize, but for Rodney, probably it was. Because, let's be honest, for Rodney, Nisenhow would have been a solo engagement and she could have had the glory of that. Whereas Bismarck, well, she had to have King George V poppling along around her and just getting in her way. Yeah. With its 14-inch guns just going boom, boom, boom occasionally, and Rodney just going, could you shut up with the pea shooters while so I can concentrate with my 16s? You're just getting in my way? Uh, by the oh, way, actually, the oh, Taki is going. I don't get paid enough for this now. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, one thing that uh, that you uh, mentioned there was a very important term when uh, calling the Graf Spe uh, heavy cruiser, mm -hmm. because uh, we have uh, quite a few questions and quite a lot. We of have a lot of questions that, on yes, that. <laughs> think that the. <laughs> <laughs> the Graf Spes were uh, or should be called battlecruisers probably because of that uh, silly pocket battleship moniker. So, mm -hmm. how's it, uh, Wesley? Oh, this question's coming to me. Okay, oh, yes. so... Um, okay, so there's a lot of ships that people like to consider battlecruisers, right? Like... Um, I know in this list we're going to be talking about fast battleships. We're going to be talking about the Gneisenau and Scharnhorst. We're going to be talking about the um, the pocket battleships. Everything is kind of on the list as a possible battle cruiser. And I think that one thing we have to keep in mind when we evaluate any of the ships is kind of their intended purpose, right? And I think that at the same time, you also have to think about how they relate to other cruisers, which is one of the problems here. So when we think about what makes a battle cruiser, we think about what it is being used for. So we're looking at scouts for the main fleet, um, which is what they were in the pre-World War One or in, in into the world first world war. And then you also have commerce rating, as Dr. Clark has mentioned several times. I think earlier I used the phrase apex predator of the open seas. And I think that is a really good way to describe them. But the definition does get incredibly muddy after the First World War. Um, and especially once people start building ships in the 1930s. And that's because speed becomes 
less of a differentiator uh, when it comes to a lot of these ships in terms of designs. Um, and the requirements placed on ships <laughs> because of the presence of air power and just the, the very different nature of, of naval warfare in the 1930s and in the Second World War really changes what people want to do. Um, also, the Washington Naval Treaty lumping battle cruisers in with battleships also causes problems uh, in the 1930s as people start building again. All that being said, you also have to take into account what cruisers are, what cruisers should be um, considered. And I have totally lost my train of thought at that exact moment, which is super embarrassing. Um, oh, do you want me to hop in for happens. a second and you come yes. after me? Go ahead. Okay. So, the whole point that you often get in is people sort of like to throw up the Alaska class. That's the actually mm, the yeah. far better example than the Deutschlands. The Alaskas mm -hmm. are could be, well be argued to be battle cruisers, but they're not because they're ordered at the same time as you have the Iowas and the Montanas. If the Montanas are built, they are definitely the big battleship, and they are roughly three times the weight of the Alaskas, which means the Alaskas are not in capital ship grade territory anymore. They are definitely in cruiser grade territory. Interesting scenario though becomes the Iowas, because if the Iowas are built at the same time as the Montanas and the Alaskas are in service, then you have a good case for making it the Alas the Iowas being your battle cruiser for the US Navy. Because they are a ship uh, they are a capital ship designed around being very, very fast. That is there there is a lot of compromises put into the Iowa design to give them speed. And that is what sets apart a battle cruiser from a battleship quite often when you're looking at their design and their hull shape and their how they're organized. The Alaskas, they are wonderful. And if you had been using them in 1914, they could well have been battle cruisers in I mean, 1914. In yeah, 1948, in 1948, they are not. They are heavy cruisers. Yeah. Because the heavy cruisers in 1948 are far bigger, far more powerful than the ones in 1914, as are the capital ships being built. Uh, the Montanas were supposed to be about 75,000 tons. The Iowas were supposed to be about 67,000 tons. The uh, Alaskas were about 25,000 tons. So it's roughly a third. It's roughly once you start going into it. And that's what, you know, that's why... I always tell, tell people, the Alaskas, I'm sorry, they are cruisers. But there's nothing wrong with being a cruiser. In fact, it's a great thing. These are the apex cruisers. And one of the key it's... things for a cruiser is a good heavy cruiser is a threat to a battle cruiser. A good heavy cruiser, if a battle cruiser is out surface raiding, and then a, there's a good heavy cruiser there, that's a problem for it when it's attacking a convoy. If there's a couple of them there, and remember, that's the normally the thing you can do. You can buy a lot of heavy cruisers for the price of your battle cruiser. So your battle cruiser can go out and do the surface raiding. But if you want to defend things, you don't really want one battle cruiser with an escort over the convoy because it'll only be in one place, and you end up with a scenario like in the one of the battles in Mediterranean where you're relying on HMS Somali, a tribal class destroyer, to drive off an Italian battleship. She does it. But that's mainly because the Italian captain thinks the Royal Navy destroyer and commander is insane. Which you can argue charging a, a, a battleship with a destroyer which is about 120 of its weight um, and you only have one torpedo left in your torpedo launcher is probably insane. But, you know, he was doing it. The first, normally, you want a good pack of heavy cruisers, a two to three to put round your convoy if you're going to be facing something like a large surface trader like a battle cruiser. And that is what your Alaska class is. They're also there to escort your carriers. They are really good things for that. That is what you're building the Alaskas for. Yeah, They're not and, battle uh... cruisers. And uh, I mean, uh, in part, the Alaskas were conceived because there were reports of the... Uh... Uh, the Japanese Navy uh, procuring uh, super cruisers, right? There were the... everyone was rumored to be yeah. procuring super cruisers. The Americans, the first thing they asked the British in 1942 when they started having design talk conversations was, "So how goes the progress of your building of super cruisers?" And the British turned around and went, uh, <laughs> "We're building HMS Vanguard instead." Americans went, "But we're sure you have designs for super cruisers. We do." Hmm. 
but we were sure you were building them. Oh no, we were just leaking that to wind up the Italians and the Germans. Uh, poor, um, the, the poor Americans had a very strange conversation with our directors on naval construction, and if you ever are lucky enough to read some of the reports in the National Archives from Stanley Goodall, you, you will see all sorts of funny things he gets asked by the Americans that they think the British are doing and the British aren't. Because the British have... Basically, the Ministry of Disinformation has been going full throttle. And the, the, the poor Americans have been getting intelligence backs from their sources in Germany and Italy coming back to them. So they've been getting this idea of what the British are doing from the Ministry of Disinformation, which is telling the Germans and the Italians what <laughs> And, basically, uh, of... it's the lovely intelligence war going on. Yeah. And uh, basically, there was also like a back and forth between the Germans, Italians, Japanese, yeah. whoever. So I, I guess that it was kind of like a... It, it turned off into a kind of an echo chamber, right? Like uh... Oh, it did. And these are the greatest... Um, the, oh, that's outside me, isn't it? It's outside. Yeah, that side. Uh, these is the greatest missed opportunity for the US Navy. Because if you'd had a couple of these around for World War II to back up a couple of carriers based on the same hulls, so if the Lexingtons and the, uh, had been divided into two battle cruisers and two carriers, the US Navy would have had a really good striking group, which they would have found a very, very useful in the early parts of the war and would have given them a lot more confidence when they were doing operations, when they worried about the Congos keeping up with the Japanese carriers. Uh, also because the, the thing uh, is, you know, they would have been able to match in up against the Congos. And, and that was a serious deficit. I know that the American Navy really knew that they had a disadvantage when it came to speed because they were missing the Lexingtons, right? So I know that, like... If you look at like the American war plans for Japan and at the time in the 20s and 30s, there was, you know, still that like climactic Jutland-esque um, battle fleet action that they were planning for. Uh, they were very concerned about the speed of the Japanese ships and, and the ships that the Japanese had that were faster than their battleships, because if if they were able to get ahead of the Americans, they could cause serious problems. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think the, the Lexington is a really good example of how the Washington Naval Treaty just totally sort of destroyed the path of, of battlecruisers because you see so many navies kind of looking at them, investing in them, uh, really thinking that that is a an important class of ship to pour a lot of money into in, in that post-1918 yeah. world. And then it all just comes to a screeching halt um, in 1921. Because yeah, you can I mean, only have one. Yeah. You can't, you can't, it's, it's like what happens with the carrier development in the late 1930s. And everyone looks at it and goes, oh, who's making the right choice? The British, the British or the Americans? Because the British go for the armoured carrier, armoured hangar carrier, let's be honest. And the Americans go for the huge flight group. Neither Navy wants to make that choice. The Americans would love armour on their flight decks. They would love the displacement. They could have armour on their flight decks because they'd like their carriers to be more survivable and easier to fix as well. And less likely to be flames. Because everyone does understand that your hangar is basically a bomb sitting above your ship, on top of your ship. Because aircraft and fuel and weapons, they're not really nice things if they get hit. And the Royal Navy doesn't have a desire to go, you know what, we really want to have less aircraft than our opponents. That's really what we want to do. It's not what either Navy wants to do, but you're having to make a choice. And you can only have one or the other. And for the British, it's a case of we're fighting on either in the Mediterranean, where you can't get away from land-based air, or on the other side of the world from our supply and industrial base. So we need our aircraft carriers to be as survival as possible and repairable as possible. So they go for the armoured hangar. The Americans are going, well, we hope we can build more. And we've got this all this space, so we're going to use the space as our protection. So basically the fact that we can hide in the vast of the oceans. But if they'd had something like this, yeah, I am pointing the right way now. Something like that, it would have been really, really useful it would have made them far more secure in their feelings about their carriers and their protection. And it's one of the most interesting things that you have might have been in history, is that 
when HMS Victorious goes over to America, uh, goes over to the Pacific and becomes USS Robin, and assisting with the issues over uh, down uh, down there, and uh, it's helping out in that part when the Americans are really short of carriers. There is a honest discussion at one point about whether or not she should be joined by HMS Renown. The British don't want to risk another KGV after what happened to Prince of Wales, but Renown can keep up with the carriers, and they're happy to send her. And the Americans are actually quite happy to have her. But in the end, it comes down to operational needs. They prefer to have Renown where they have her, and they don't uh, not they don't want to pay really for an upgrade upfit up. Grade and a refit of her, like Victorious is going to go through. But that's actually a very. Oh, we seem to have lost connection. We are we are going to be uh, forever in suspense as to what that, that very was. It's a we very close are... run thing and almost happens. <laughs> okay, uh, we no are re-establishing connection. I have no idea what happened there. I have no idea either, but uh, your image seems to be missing. Yes, let me have a conversation with it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's back. No. Uh, turn on camera. <laughs> there you go. Ah, something's happening. I have no idea what happened there. I think it's the spirit of Drakenafel. He's upset that uh, we're doing this without him. Probably, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's a suggestion from uh, Sophie Gardner 101 The Iron Brook clogged his data stream. Oh, that's terrible. Possibly, but no. Um, <laughs> the camera should be on now and should be showing. Uh, the, there is something loading, but uh, it uh, fails to load. Well, we'll see. I'll... But no. It would have been a very interesting sort of a thing. If actually Renown had gone down there, then you could well have ended up with a scenario that you have Renown, Victorious, and Saratoga doing operations together. And they could have got up to a lot more because if Saratoga and Victorious have Renown with them, then they have some protection if they come across a Congo. Or if they come across Japanese heavy crews, they have something which can give them a good edge in fighting. And buy them time. Because that remember, that's the purpose of an escort if you're escorting a carrier. It's like what happens with Tappy Free. Your job isn't necessarily to win the battle. Your job is to buy time for the carriers to get the aircraft into the air. And of course, that famously goes wrong with Glorious. But she was did just have two small destroyers. To take on two fast battleships, even though they were eleven-inch armed fast battleships. Uh, and actually, I think uh, we have uh, gone. Uh, I'll quickly switch here uh, uh, while I ask uh, uh, Doctor Clark to maybe turn off and on the camera again, or maybe uh, drop the call and uh, rejoin fully, because it seems that the Discord is having some issues. Ah, haha! -ha! Okay, issue solved. Back. <laughs> cool. Uh, uh, see, it's Wesley. To... Did I buy time enough time for you to remember uh, for you to get back on your trade? Yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things <laughs> I was going to point out, um, and yeah, I, I got totally derailed there. Is, um, and I'm actually going to bring in kind of one of the things to keep in mind with battle cruisers is that it's all about intended usage of the battle cruiser. Um, of the ship, I should say, and whether or not it's a battle cruiser. And in, in many ways, like the Deutschland class um, does fit that bill. But one of the problems that the the those ships have after they have a fleet around them, <laughs> not just themselves, is top speed, I believe. If I remember correctly, they're a couple of knots slower than all of the other German ships that they would be interacting with. And that prevents them from fulfilling their basic goals as battle cruisers. Uh, which again are to scout, to rule the waves um, outside of the large fleet areas. Their top speed was 26 knots. Most of the Queen Elizabeth class by this point could get up to 24, 20, and maybe a bit more knots if they were pushed. Of course, famously, HMS Rodney got up to 25 something knots. 
there are battle cruisers going around the world which have thir- uh, which are 32 33 knot ships they're not fast they are they are status pieces they are great for show they are great for presence but they are heavy cruisers emphasis on the heavy and honestly they are queens of the baltic that's what i always think when i look at the panzer sheath i look at them and think you're a baltic queen you can absolutely dominate anything that's that's moving in the baltic but beyond that you don't want to get out there really uh, I, I mean they they could be also like powerful in the north sea like close to home ports i i presume that all the german designs if they you could... drop the range requirements for the surface raider you could make them a bit more compact and basically like okay they they wouldn't be possibly able to break through the blockade or anything like that but they they would be a like a, something to be reckoned with when you are sending out uh, your destroyers and light cruisers for patrol right that's they would they, they're not something you want to have your light cruisers run across but they are something which if um let's put this way something heavier runs across them they're going to be in trouble and that's really their problem they can't get away from anything heavier and that is the first and best definition of a battle cruiser Fast enough to run away from anything it can't outfight. Big enough to outfight anything it can't outrun. And the Deutschland class aren't fast enough to uh, to outrun anything they can't outfight. In fact, there are a fair number of battleships which could probably... Uh, a World War One vintage battleships which could have caught it on a bad day for it. And... Oh, anything that can... And... Uh, on more troublesome that it's not going to be able to outfight anything it can't outrun. So it's not a battle cruiser. It and it's not designed to be. Just because you're a large surface raider doesn't mean you're a battle cruiser. They are a heavy cruiser. They are a status piece. They are something built to keep the German yards going. And what I'm always amazed by their construction when I'm looking at Germany is that they actually managed to build them at all when you consider the defense industry they have left. And you think about what they do. They build the three Deutschland class. Then they build the two Scharnhorst. And then they go ahead and they build the Bismarck and the Tirpitz. At the same time, they produce a hull for the Graf Zeppelin. You sit yeah. there and look at it all and you just go, that's amazing for your industry considering where you're starting from. But also... You're supposedly preparing for the likelihood of war with France to begin with. Let's consider the French Navy. Uh, uh, okay, they have the Dunkirks and the Riccolos. We uh, Wesley is holding in the laughter very, very nicely. I am going to try and be as polite as I can. I'm not the biggest fan of all forward gun ships, but I have to admit the way the French do it probably is makes a slightly more sense than the way the British do it, because at least all guns which are forward can actually fire forward, rather than you have one turret which cannot fire forward. And no one please get me started on the G3 design, with the most pointless turret known to mankind. Oh, the, the, the turret image chips, right? Like... Yes! The most pointless <laughs> turret known to mankind. I mean, G3 was going to come up sometime in this conversation, right? Like... <laughs> yes. Maybe you're just bringing it forward a few minutes. Uh, uh, yeah. But leaving that to uh, that sort of whole thing, the French Navy are still fairly good. And that actually also puts, uh, starts off the Italian really build up because the Italians and the French had sort of agreed parity. And when the Germans start building up to counter the French, the French start building up to counter the Germans. So the Italians start building up to counter the French. And then the British are sort of looking at them going, you do realize because of our strategic situation, we have to build to counter you as well, uh, i.e. Ita- Italy and Germany. And then there's Japan. And then the four Americans are going, we don't want to spend money on a navy. We're Congress. It's not nice. We don't. We, we want to spend money on other things, not a navy. You know, we 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 we, you're not making us spend money on a navy, and the Royal Navy's going. Sorry, we're having to build up to deal with these people, and there's also Japan. So that's sort of the the few the the like 
two members in Congress and their dog who actually want to spend some money on the Navy are able to use Japan as the reason. But it's also maintaining parity with Britain, which is sort of one of the things they're going there. Because they're trying, everyone's trying to build up their, their forces with the idea of preventing a war. The Germans and Italians think they'll get so powerful as to the Japanese that no one wants to fight them. And therefore there will be no war. And the British and the French and the Americans all have this idea that if they're strong enough, they won't be pushed and they won't have to fight a war. Everyone is thinking, build up and we won't have to fight a war. The trouble is, some of those nations are thinking, we're building up and then we'll get what we want without fighting a war. Because we want this, we want that. The others are building up just thinking, we don't want a war. It makes a difference in the pace of reconstruction. Yeah. If, you're and, uh... if you're building up out of avarice... Uh, versus building up out of um, oh, do we have to? Uh, I mean that uh, probably also touches a question that uh, because I've started going through the pre-registered questions because uh, yeah. I mean we are quite far in the stream already <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, cleaner corn that was picked by uh, Wesley. Uh, why is it that no one else besides the Germans, British, and to some extent the Japanese decided to invest in making battle cruisers? I, I mean we kind of touched on it, right? Like. When it call, uh, all comes down to it, money. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and like it's it's a combination of money, sort of naval requirements in terms of what they're hoping to achieve with their navy, and really, when you look at the period where the most battle cruisers are being built around the world, you're talking about the what eight, uh, six, I will say six years before the First World War. And at that point, the British and the Germans are kind of in this uh, incredible naval arms race that is happening. And everybody else is, you know, just starting to build dreadnoughts. They're, they're just starting to sort of match the, the previous sort of big innovation that the British and, and Germans had introduced. So a lot of it is timing. And then, you know, World War I happens and all the major navies get involved in some way. And then afterwards, the treaty uh, occurs. I'm going to correct Wesley on one thing there. Uh, it, yes. No, it, it's it's the, the British, Italians, and Americans have introduced. The Germans okay. then sort of catch up to it. Because I, 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 it's it's one of those interesting things that happens in a race. And that is definitely the billing. It's always billed as the Anglo-German naval race. But you have the Germans sort of come in and they're like, the, the Italians are already building the Dante Alighieri. Uh, the... Americans have, I think they're the South Carolinas, the first uh, first dreadnoughts they have, are already yes. under construction. They might not be dreadnoughts as quite dreadnoughts with turbines and all these sort of things, but they are definitely dreadnought style. And then the Germans sort of come in, and then the Germans get the credit for being the other dreadnought power. And it's a case of, just cruel, you just have better press than the poor Italians and the Americans. How well, often is in history that the Americans don't have the better press? Well, it's it's when the British are talking so much about you at this point in history. And the Royal Navy but, really needs to make you look like a threat so that they could spend more money on new fancy ships. Yes, yeah. and also, we, but don't worry, we also use the Italians and the Americans for something as well. Because if you've ever noticed in here, what happens, the Americans and the Italians and the Japanese start pushing up the gun sizes. And so Britain responds. And then poor Germany gets dragged along because Germany can't let Britain have bigger guns than it. So really, the gun, the, the numbers race is with Germany, but the tech race is between Britain, Italy, Japan and America. And it's this really sort of complicated naval race going on. And then you've got the South Americans having their own little race, which is also infecting the technology. And all these people are building them, and all of them are looking at them, and the Dutch keep flirting with idea of battle cruisers or battleships. They never know which one to go for, and usually, as a rule, they've just finally made up their mind. They're kind of like the indecisive person at the buffet who you're standing behind, and you really start to hate after about five minutes, because they're not sure which thing to have when you're going, it's a buffet, just take a, take a spoonful of it all and go away. You don't need, you, you can do that. But they're going, no, no, we have to pick one. So eventually they decide on battleships, and World War One happens, so they don't build them. And eventually they decide on battle cruisers, and World War Two happens, so they don't get them. The joy of the Dutch. 
What they should have done is gone Dutch with the British on some ship. Yeah. I I mean the the Sorry. some Sorry, of the bad joke. <laughs> some of the Dutch uh, like considerations for the uh, new uh, new large ships were kind of battle cruiserish. Some were kind of battleshipish. Some were kind of large cruiserish. So it's. Uh, I, I mean, it's, as a, uh, it's that's kind of why the I same used the mess, yeah. to describe them. Yeah, it's it's kind of the same mess as the destroyer leaders, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a large destroyer? Is it a small cruiser? Is is it an oceanic scout? What is it? <laughs> <laughs> you can never decide. If you don't want to, you can never decide. There's so many options. Yep. Mm. Uh, you can just call it whatever you want, really. You can. You can, but uh, other navies might laugh at you. Like, I, I, I mean, well, calling your aircraft to be carrier... Fair, uh, other, you know, other navies will laugh at you whatever happens. True. But uh, things like calling your aircraft carrier a uh, through deck cruiser... Actually, to be fair, other navies probably looked at Britain at that point and went, you jammy dodgers, that's how you got it through the treasury. <laughs> and Britain's going... <laughs> all names going, yeah. We know how to get it past the treasury. It's a, you know, but it, on this, that was a trick they used before. Because in 1938, HMS Unicorn is a forward aviation support ship. True. But, uh, She's not an again... aircraft carrier. Anyone who tells you HMS Unicorn was an aircraft carrier are factually incorrect or lying to you. Uh, either way, that is, they were honestly, the Royal Navy is very true. She's always listed as a forward aviation support ship. Uh, anyway, since uh, touching up on the uh, Jutland is inevitable in this context, especially since we have a lot of questions that are aiming at uh, the Jutland, let's uh, take the mm -hmm. Nitro Pirates one because it's it's probably the longest one and it sums up all the other questions into one neat question. So the question okay. reads... Uh, I've read that the British battlecruisers at Jutland, which famously fared very badly, were actually victims of poor flash management, partly due to overstocking of ammunition and cordite, which was literally in the corridors and on decks, and partly due to the flash doors being left open, which allowed the explosions to spread throughout the ships. If this is true, and if it hadn't happened, do you think this may have changed the course of battlecruiser history for the next few decades? And I believe uh, this was picked by Wesley, so he gets the first go. Mm -hmm. I did pick this, but I will defer to Dr. Clark, because I know he uh, has some serious thoughts on this one. <laughs> okay. Okay, all right. So, in the nicest way, Jutland, the battle cruisers, were being used in ways they shouldn't be used. They should never have been caught between two battle fleets. They should never have been in that position. Once you found the enemy, you were so late the information back to your battle fleet and you skedaddle out the way if you want to be a flying wing of your battle fleet that's fine but you do that from behind the battle fleet using your speed to maneuver ahead of the enemy you don't get caught between them or in the front or in the line if you're meant to being used in the line and both jellico and bt fall for this one you're in trouble because battle cruisers are not designed to be in a line pummeling each other or pummeling with uh, pummeling with battleships that's just not what they're designed for secondly unfortunately you are right, Nitro Pirate. There were, le to a lesser or greater extent on each ship, attempts made to make firing as rapidly as possible. This was done because the Battle Cruiser Force, as a bright idea by Admiral Beatty, had been moved to the Fur for four, so they'd be closer if the Germans raided the UK again, because there were various raids on, such as Scarborough, etc., where they did naval attacks on shore targets in the UK to try and lull sections of the British fleet out. And the idea was we'll move the battlecruiser force to, down to the Firth of Forth from Scarpa Flow so they are that much quicker to react because they're that much closer. Which is a lovely idea but there are no gunnery ranges in the, in the Firth of Forth. So you can't actually fire your guns. So this makes your targeting very bad. So the other bright idea they had, and this one comes down to a gentleman called Chatfield, 
who goes on to become first Sea Lord prior to World War Two, and is the guy who comes up with the bright idea of let's build 14 inch armed battleships because he's just full of bright ideas is a uh, let's make them fire as quickly as possible because that's what they did in the Napoleonic Wars. And to do that, they came up with various competitions and they basically informally told the ships that, well, it nothing nothing matters apart from speed of fire. The quicker you fire, the more likely to hit the enemy you are, more likely to hit, and then you, it, there's no risk if you're hit because you'll hit them first. And, well, there is that old tradition in navies, fire first, fire fur uh, furthest, and fire quickest, and keep firing until the enemy's down, so... You can understand the idea of where it comes from. But this leads to all sorts of very interesting decisions, which put the battlecruisers in a rather poor state. And it's because of various battles that you get 5th Battle Squadron sent down to the battlecruiser force, because they are almost fast enough to keep up with them, and they have actually been doing gunnery practice. And Jellico has basically insisted that actually the battlecruisers are going to cycle one squadron at a time, through the Grand Fleet to go up and do their own gunnery training. It's also because he started to have real problems with Je uh, with BT in terms of trusting the information he's getting. And his aim is that if he has his own battlecruiser squadron or fast squadron going around, which he much he's been using 5th Battle squ uh, Squadron for, he would have his own reconnaissance force in the Grand Fleet. So instead of relying on the battlecruiser fleet, because... Let's put it this way. BT not communicating properly was not a new thing at Jutland. It was something which was understood in the fleet. Uh, the difference was that they kept trying to manoeuvre him to have uh, different flag, flag lieutenants who would be able to, who would actually deal this issue. He picked Seymour. He was offered a different officer who was very qualified and considered one of the best communications officers in the fleet and one of the best young minds in the fleet. He was called Somerville, the officer he was offered, but he turned him down because he didn't have enough family connections. And of course, Somerville is the gentleman who in <laughs> World War II is in charge of naval operations at Mirza Kabir, Force H, and does all sorts of things in the, in the Indian Ocean in charge of the Eastern Fleet. So, yeah, BT, you showed great now in your selection of officers again. Um, uh, one of the pieces... Like, kind of, uh, like, a reverse Midas touch, that, like, uh, whoever yeah, beat it, rejected it, was... <laughs> <laughs> it, it's actually, the best compliment you, you could get was being uh, rejected by BT. <laughs> he rejects... Uh, the the off list of officers he rejects... Um, it's just, it gets absurd when you start looking at some of the Royal Navy officers who the Royal Navy has. I think at one point he rejected Andrew Cunningham. Oh. Yeah, it, it basically, if, if, if you pick a who's who of admirals that fought for the Royal Navy in World War II, BT at some point was uh, chose someone else over them at almost every single point. Um, along with this, so the part the part of the question that I thought was maybe most interesting was how that performance was kind of interpreted at the time and how it affected battle cruiser designs and just thoughts on the sort of battle cruisers in general over the next decade or decades. And the quick answer is that it really didn't. You know, um, if you look at what's happening in in Britain after 1916, if uh, or in several other nations after 1916, you see a continued belief that battle cruisers are, you know, the way to go. Like people want to build battle cruisers. They value that kind of mix of speed and big guns. Now for the British, that's, you know, the G, I think it's the G3 design as Dr. Clark brought up. It's the Lecting Lexingtons for the Americans. But then within the war itself, it's also, you know, it's, I guess Hood is the best example, but the Germans were also working on later battle cruiser designs as well. And in all cases, I think there's a pretty good recognition, especially from the British, that, oh, this isn't a problem with our entire sort of shipbuilding theory. This is a problem because we did something real dumb. And let's not do that dumb thing again, and I bet we'll be okay. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, but, I mean, you know, I think it's maybe tarnished Battlecruiser reputation for all of history because people... Jutland is the battle people learn about, right? It is the sort of naval action that is, before World War II, sort of the one people learn about. And yes, the British battlecruisers kind of went boom a few times uh, in that action. Yeah. Uh, but uh, then again, also, them going boom is often like taken like uh, they had a light armor, uh, lighter armor than metal ships, <laughs> so they went boom, but that didn't really play a role, right? Mm -hmm. like... no, not as much. And it's also, it's very easy history, though. And there are... I, I'm just going to reference it also, because it's been referenced in the chat. Jason, the reason I, I have got a bookcase behind me, I'm halfway through constructing it. Uh, there's more shelves going in down below, which is why the books are all up here at the moment, rather than in the boxes down below. But in all these books, there are lots and lots of books in naval history, in history terms, which go for the easy history route. And the easy history is, that blew up, so that must have been bad. They don't build anymore. And the first thing that comes up with that one is you go, well, what about HMS Hood? Oh, no, she's the first fast battleship. She's not a battlecruiser. And you go, well, no, she's built as a battlecruiser. Ah, yes, but really she's the first fast battleship. Because it's a very easy history. And there are books, mostly, and this is just in my bookshelf, but I'm sure Wesley has a similar one, and Tucky, I know you do as well. We all have a shelf where we put up the books which we have because they're easy, general, quick history, which are good overviews, but they're full of little minor errors. But when we want a quick overview of something to quickly read through, we grab them. But they're not our first choice for a reference book when we want to make a reference or we want to actually check the nuance on something or the context or something. That's usually in the pile behind us. And so this is the thing about it. It becomes, it's very easy and it's then it's repeated in television programs. It becomes a joke line. Uh, yes, there have been comedians who've made jokes about the Battle Cruises of Jutland. We could and, all be uh, slightly worried that anyone managed to make, make there, a good There's comedians for everybody. Yeah. Yes, I, there I, is. I, I have to say, I actually, I got into this company by uh, first uh, playing and interacting on uh, World of Tanks forums back when World of Tanks was in beta. And mm. obviously, Tanks uh, history is uh, also full of this. Like, uh, I mean, the Ronsons slash Death Traps slash... Uh, uh, oh, well. The amount of... The, the whole um, Sherman story, Tom, Tommy Cookers. Yes. The whole Tommy Cookie uh, took a, a cooker thing. And he sort of go, so does anyone have any actual details from the time of people calling them that or anyone calling them that? No. Apparently not. That's, uh, no. yeah. That, 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 I, 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 if anyone does have a book and does has been able, is able to show it, I would be glad to read it. But so far, every per, every historian I've talked to who specializes in tanks and stuff has gone, yeah, that comes after World War II. That's about 1955, 1956, you start hearing that. Yeah. And you sit there and um, go, but that's one of the myths about tanks, about Sherman tanks. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it's uh, on one thing, it's, uh, it's fairly natural because a lot of authors just want uh, to catch attention. So they go for a funny or interesting anecdote, even though it might not be true, but it's well told. Mm. So it attracts oh, attention. Yeah. And I mean, often... Like I, I was really uh, my, my mind was blown when I was I was reading the Shattered Sword because only then I realized like how different, how vastly different were the Japanese carrier operations from the, the American ones, and how all the books before that were written usually based on Morrison and uh, on basically Western sources, how very completely wrong they were and suddenly a lot of the things that were taken as a uh, japanese mistakes in the battle they started to make sense because hey they actually like that that's how they did things that that was like the proper procedure for them like that wasn't a mistake that was deliberate and it worked before for them so that's why they were doing it so yeah and it's like it's... there has just actually been one come in the chat on the youtube which is a really a good one Nick Sniff has just written, technically, the KGB's battleships Anson and Howe was supposed to be named BC Angelico. That is one of the most commonly repeated myths 
you hear. And usually it comes down to they didn't get it done because BT and Jellico, there were still a few between the faction and the Navy. Actually, they were always going to be Anson and Hal because Anson and Hal were two of the admirals, along with Rodney, that was go that were going to be in the admiral class battle cruisers. But when they chose Rodney and Nelson for that, the next two names up from battleships were going to be Anson and Hal. So they decided to go with King George V and Prince of Wales because they were basically trying to be nice because they were naming one for the uh, one for the gentleman who was king and one for the gentleman who was supposed to be king but then was no longer king. But you know, there's an issue. But then it's Anson and Hal. But you can read a dozen, two dozen books which will tell you it was supposed to be BT and Jellico. Because it's a nice story. And because you can find people who say that anecdotally at parties. But you look in the actual files in the National Archives and those things. And the whole way through, it's Anson and Howe. Because the Royal Navy Ship Naming Committee are one of the most... Well, especially in this period. The, ba the Capital Ship Naming Committee, the committee which deals with capital ships, are one of the most staid conservative organisations known to mankind and will never knowingly jump precedent or order in admirals. Ever. They are, they, honestly, to try... They also get involved in naming aircraft carriers and Churchill almost has a fit with some of the names they propose for aircraft carriers. And the light fleet class carriers, their original namings, basically get renamed thanks to the first Sea Lord Andrew uh, and um, Churchill basically ordering the committee to go and do it again about three times over. Because the names they've come up with are... Um... Well, they decided the names appropriate to aircraft carriers, because they obviously weren't capital ships yet, true capital ships were names which had traditionally been for... Well, previously been used for flower-class corvettes. For some reason... Yes, for some reason, <laughs> Churchill decided that wasn't happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I kind of... Um, also missed the, when the American practice changed from uh, famous battles and stuff for aircraft carriers to famous people, because that's kind of meh. They, they had my destroyers. Favorite American, my favorite American carrier will always be USS Shangri-La. Uh, yes, uh, that's, <laughs> that's definitely one of the better ones. That's a, uh, Enterprise is just the favorite name, whatever ship it's on. But Shangri-La is the best aircraft carrier name the US Navy's ever come up with. As just a I, pure I, carrier name. I will just throw out there, as an American, I can say this. After World War II, the Americans lost their ability to name ships, and everything since then has been a mistake. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, uh, so I did want to actually, you know, we kind of drifted away from it there, yeah. but, uh, and I see that debate is real hot in Twitch chat right now about it, is the hood. Hood is a problem when you're talking about classifying and categorizing ships because of its kind of unique position. Right, so Hood is designed and constructed inside the First World War. Um, it is the largest ship that the Royal Navy has, unless I'm forgetting something, which I really hope I'm not. No, it is. And and then it would maintain that status for many decades. It would be the largest ship in the world during most of the interwar period. Yes, or at least... Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, largest ship because it was before the era of uh, super tankers. So yeah, like... I, I'm always super hesitant to like make definitive claims like that because I can't pretend to know the size of every ship that existed at that point. But it was really big. It, it was definitely it, the biggest warship. Yes, yeah. and but the the reason it occupies this really interesting position is because it is designed at a time before there's this big shift in, in capital ship design around how to proportion and position armor aboard ship. So, you know, pre-World War I into World War I, you have kind of an old school methodology for how to place armor on ships, very spread out. Uh, you're protecting a lot of the ship. And it's not everywhere on the ship, but, you, you, it, but what you see after the First World War is you see a move towards 
armor concentration, right? Of, of making sure that you protect the most important pieces and a lot of other pieces may not have any armor whatsoever. I believe it was I, the Americans that started using that on their Colorado. I'm so bad with ship uh, class I, names. I think but... it was already with uh, Pennsylvania, yes. already okay. during the World War One. But it, it's something which certainly becomes uh, exasperated by the treaties, because mm -hmm. again, it's kind. It, it's like with the aircraft carriers. It's uh well, we really like armor everywhere, but we can't under the treaty limits. But they'd already started it because it could help make your ship lighter in various mm -hmm. places. And yep. there's also the fact that the Queen Elizabeth has sort of got that and the R-Class has sort of got that because everyone's sort of getting that, but it's sort of about 1913, 1914 when they're starting to think these things and then World War One happens. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is then everyone's really on a go slow because everyone wants to see what happens. Because, and this is the other dirty little secret about wars, Navies are incredibly nosy. I mean, they send at the Battle of Tsushima, there are so many people there sitting there to watch from foreign navies. Uh, on both sides, with both fleets, the, there are observers everywhere. There are observers in World War I going there, ar going around the various fleets. In World War II, there yeah. are observers going around the various fleets. It's what they do to try and find out what's going on. So it makes perfectly sense to do a go slow with your building because you never know, you might learn something which means, oh, we get, that decision was bad. It looked good on paper, but it was bad. Very bad. Very, very, very bad. Uh, <laughs> let's quickly change that and pretend we did something else. Mm -hmm. Now. Yeah, but, uh, but then also looking forward from the hood, so that's kind of looking backwards around sort of lessons learned and changes but then looking forward you know the there was always the assumption when hood is being built hood is being designed that after the first world war there would be more naval building right they are planning for they have all these designs in place where like okay once we stop you know the war which is costing us so much money and we can't really do anything except for you know maintain what we have we're going to start building again so hood is never designed to be the largest ship in the Royal Navy for the next 20 years, right? It is designed to interact and, and be there with the ships that... <laughs> to, it is there to exist and interact with the ships that will be built after the First World War. The problem is, is that all those get canceled before they're built. And also, it, it, the, the other point I was to make about, always make about Hood, is her three sisters are stopped and started so often because they keep changing their designs. That's why none of them are built at the time. And you could have had a really interesting scenario with that because if the Royal Navy had even built even one more of those, well, everyone has to look overlook Hood. If they had to look overlook, let's say, Hood and Rodney get completed, then the Royal Navy really does have a very, very fast, powerful pair of ships which are bigger than everyone else's for the 1920s and 1930s and again the Royal Navy isn't exactly bashful these things they go, they said Hood along with Repulse on a world tour to go around the world and go hello and they send it with all the D-class cruisers they can grab as well so it has all the latest light cruisers it has uh, Repulse and it has its hood going around and basically it's the Royal Navy going around the world waving the flag saying look at how lovely and wonderful we are and by the way have you noticed that we've got a battle cruiser which can get all the way around the world in fact a pair of them that can and that means that if you really annoy us we can find your trade anywhere in the world and you'll need yeah. something very big to take on this won't you yeah mm -hmm. yeah it, it is interesting it's, it's a interesting what if uh, around a lot of that timing, you know, if the Washington Naval Treaty doesn't happen in the year that it happens, uh, the situation is probably so different, even uh, a few years in the future in terms of building, that it is unlikely that it would exist in anything like its its state that it actually happens uh, in history. Yeah, I mean, uh, apart from the, uh, from the hood, uh, 
there were the, the Americans who were working on the Lexingtons and the Japanese were running their 8-8 program, right? Where they wanted how many? Eight new battle cruisers? Uh, no, four new battle eight. cruisers, four new battleships, right? Basically, they were trying to get to a fleet of eight decent battleships yeah. and eight decent battle cruisers. Um, yes. It would have been interesting to watch them do that. It would have probably taken most of the 1920s and well into the 1930s to build that fleet for the Japanese. Because they were trying to build them as much domestically as possible. There are limitations on their infrastructure, there are limitations on their finances, and there are other things they want to do. But, there is part of which sometimes sits there and think with the, uh, thinks for the 1920s, uh, 1920 Washington Treaty, if it had been a little bit later, you would have probably had a G3 or something in service. So you wouldn't have probably got Rodney and now. Oh, it seems we lost uh, Dr. Clark again. Uh, it's it's weird. We, we lose him and then he comes directly back. It's just yes. a momentary hiccup. I, I'm afraid Come it's uh, some internet issues. Uh, maybe on top of the... Ah, hello. there, there oh, he hi. is. Uh, so, I, I yeah. mean, uh, from what I've uh, seen, there seems to be some uh, large issues going on uh, Facebook, WhatsApp and stuff. So maybe it's uh, affecting... Uh, uh, Discord uh, as well, I'm not sure, but uh, let, let's hope it will last until the end. <laughs> Everything seems to be going down. At my own house at the moment, uh, WhatsApp has gone down for the entire family, which um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh... is terrible, because it means all my cousins can't communicate. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've heard as well. Uh, fa basically, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, uh, Microsoft services, but... Uh, actually, given the discussion with the hood and uh, with the stuff uh, that touches a question that I've also seen in the uh, in the chat uh, um, from both uh, Killerbin who also submitted it to the questions and uh, others I believe it was a uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mazepa and stuff basically how is it with the German battlecruisers shouldn't they be considered the first uh, fast battleships already like the Derflingers and the von der Tan and these guys. That is, an, that is actually an interesting argument to put uh, to put in, and the thing you come up with is more and more when you look at them. Battleships are on a point are a sort of a point on a spectrum, uh, and then there's cruisers down there. Battle cruisers are on the spectrum between them, and then there's actually. When we get later on, then close to World War II, they become fast battleships, which sort of sit on the spectrum slightly towards the cruisers, but in this little sort of box, not quite at the battleships, but you know, not quite. They're definitely not at the cruiser end, and they're sort of they're far closer to battleships than anything. The German battle cruisers, they are more slightly more well armed. They have slightly less firepower in terms of their guns are usually smaller than their British counterparts. But they are ultimately not really fast battleships. And you can say this because Hood isn't a fast battleship. Because when you start to look at the fast battleships and what I tend to treat as the epitome of the fast battleship, which is the Iowa class. As I know I said compare earlier, compared to a Montana and and Alaska, it would be the battle cruiser, but it really is the fast battleship. The thing about the Germans and their battle cruisers is that yes, they might be up armored, but at no point does anyone think that their their battle cruiser should go toe to toe with a British battleship. At no point does anyone want the von der Tan or the Sedlitz or anything going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a British battleship. It's not what they're built for. It's not what they want to be anywhere near. And when they are, they suffer. They even suffer at Dogger Bank and various other things. The German battle cruisers are battle cruisers. They are on they are towards the battleship end of that spectrum. But that's very sensible if you're the Germans versus the British. If you're the British building a battle cruiser, you're talking about building something to go across and go around the whole world. 
that could be protecting trade in Indian Ocean in the South Atlantic, like the Falklands, or in the Far East on the Pacific. It could be doing stuff in the Mediterranean. It could be doing anywhere around the world. It's got to emphasize speed. And if at any point it comes across anything which it can't fight, you can guarantee the Royal Navy can send a battle fleet there that will take it on. That's the, Brit that's the British advantage because of their fleet and their geography. The German situation, because of their geography, means that if they want to get anywhere, they first have to fight their way past the British. Which, yes, it might be a running fight. They might manage to scrape past the British battle cruisers and out into the open ocean, but there's going to be a fight. So they have to design their ships with that in mind. There is no chance of them getting a free meal, a free way out to the sea. They have to fight their way past the British. But here is the really interesting thing. No nation probably needed to, to actually build fast battleships more than Germany in World War I. Because if they could have built ships which had equivalent armor of battleships but were faster and had the fire required firepower, they could have actually done something. Because the way you can overcome a larger fleet, a numerically superior fleet perhaps, as I've shown at Toshima, is being able to turn the tactical advantage to your strategic advantage, i.e. being able to concentrate your weapons where they can't respond in kind. That's what the Germans need to do. They need to be able to turn the British T. They didn't have the fleet to do that. And their battle cruisers weren't going to do that for them. They were still very much a scouting force. And they were a very good scouting force. A very capable scouting force. They also managed and to take an enormous punishment at Jutland. They That's... did. A fair number of them managed to get back to port and never left again because they'd taken that much damage. But they had got home. And that's a very good, strong testimony to the quality of their construction and the quality of their design. But it doesn't make them a fast battleship. However, I will say this in a small plug for my own channel at the moment. Because on Patreon, currently one of the choices up for vote for the Patreon's options for this month is replacing Sheer with Thrawn and Tirpitz with Tarkin and imagining what fleet you'd get for the High Seas fleet. Okay. I love my patrons. I love their suggestions. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. That's a, that's an interesting proposal. It's currently uh, available to be voted for if you want to talk. Okay, that's a, yeah, it's a, that's that's so, interesting. Bringing us back to history, um, I, I will throw out there that I made a flippant comment earlier about you can name your ships whatever you want. But in many ways, what the Germans do before the First World War is they are building in direct answer to what the British are building. Like you see this in their in their design timelines, in their building timelines. They are building a fleet to match the Grand Fleet or the British, the Royal Navy. Yeah. And because of that, they are imagining a role for the ships that they are building that exactly match what the British have imagined and how they're going to use their battle cruisers. Right, so so they are self-designing something that they believe is a battle cruiser, and if nothing else matters in terms of you know how we're categorizing and throwing definitions at ships, you know the, the purpose and what the designers and the constructors are calling and imagining them to be is is something that has to be considered. It's true. And in many ways, this is why you get the, the legacy of Jutland is why you get the fast battleship in World War II. Because starters under the treaty system, no one wants to build a battle cruiser or a battleship. You want to build something which is a 90% solution of both because you can't build both. And your other thing is you've got this legacy of Jutland. So the battle cruiser name is has a bad toxic. reputation. It's politically toxic. So you instead build fast battleships. And of course, you can do that by World War II because you've got the power density in terms of your engines that you can actually build something with that armor and build something with those capabilities and get it up to the required speeds that it's okay. It's not quite as fast as you could probably build a battle cruiser up to, but it's fast enough. 
Yeah, I mean that uh, that ties out uh, ties into uh, earlier Twitch comment about uh, how did the uh, uh, lighter smaller boilers uh, influence the uh, development of the fast battleships. But then again, you you can design fast battleship even with older systems, right? It's just you, you probably can. need to uh, sacrifice a bit of armor. I mean, kind of like comparing the, the North Carolinas and the South Dakotas, right? It's... Yeah, the South Dakotas could you could uh, uh, South Dakotas probably have more of a claim to being the first sort of fast battleship design than the than Hood does. And arguably, if you want to go back further, if Jellicoe had got his way and there'd been small tube boilers used for the Queen Elizabeth class, they would have been the first fast battleships because they've been capable of doing 28 knots with their armor at the time. No one would argue they weren't fast battleships. Uh, yep. But That's... he was persuaded by constructors that it would add too much time to their construction time. <laughs> On me. And so they didn't get them. Well, I mean. In the end, it meant that they were there at Jutland available, right? <laughs> well, considering Jutland takes place in 1916 and they were ordered in 1913 and 19, uh, 1913, they, they'd have probably um, been there, whatever happened. And as it turned out, Renown and Repulse, which was started later, stopped and then refitted with small tube boilers. Under construct uh, that suddenly appear from somewhere, um, probably suggest that they could actually have done it on time because Renown and Pulse come into service not long after. Well, uh, not long after Jutland, they come into full service and full availability, which is another reason why when people, uh, uh, one of the points often used about Jutland is it cripples the Royal Navy's battle cruiser force, and you sit there and go. Well, yes, they lose three, but they've got two brand new ones coming into service, and they actually have more around the world in other places, so... And the two brand new ones are basically another generation well, leave with the, the armament, right? From 13.5 yes, to 15 inches. Yeah, and the, the, the two brand new ones, there isn't a German battle cruiser that is built that can match them. They have... Mm, to an extent, better armor. Uh, in some areas, not as good armor. In some areas, better armor. And they have those 15-inch guns. Yes, they only have six of them. But they're fast. They're capable. And they are not the ships you want to be. You want to get caught by. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Hetman Mazape in the chat is actually talking about ships that I... I shamefully, I, I have to admit, I completely forgot about them when I was uh, uh, picking up pictures for the slideshow. And uh, they, like, it's, it's really a shameful display for me, from me because they were very famous. They actually got to shoot their guns in anger in uh, World War II. The, and they also uh, migrated from the battlecruiser to the fast battleship category. So, uh, kind of, sort of. The Congo class uh, battle cruisers. Uh, there is a question from Hetman Mazepa uh, for the Japanese. Where did battle cruisers fit into their Kantai Kesen doctrine in terms of engaging a U.S. fleet, making its way across the Pacific? So my understanding here is that basically by the time the Kantai Kesen doctrine was focusing on America, the Congos were already being converted to the fast battleships, right? And their main role was basically be the like big guns of the fleet screen to like kind of make uh, enemy cruisers go away and then only then rejoin the battle line if they survived. They had those. They had two role, two roles. They had. You must remember the whole doctrine of the Kantai Kesson depends upon having accurate intelligence as to where the Americans are, if they're coming to you, if they're the ones coming to you, or the British if they're coming to you. And denying them intelligence. And that's entirely why the Japanese cruisers slowly turn into aircraft... Heavy cruisers slowly turn into aircraft carriers. Slowly gaining more and more aircraft. And eventually Ibuki, uh, Ibuki comes out and is an aircraft carrier. And it's also why you have the Congos. And eventually they're talking about their new super heavy cruisers. Because the idea is the Congos will stop the American reconnaissance. 
and then they will then they will join in the battle uh, join in the battle line and that's why they're sort of upgraded to a fast battleship standard but pr sort of fast battleship standard i should say and then their next job, and this is the, one of the things, the Congos are going to be the busiest ships in the Kantai Kessin Doctrine. Because yes. on the way in, they're supposed to be watching, sh shadowing, and annihilating the scout screen of the Americans. Then they're supposed to fight in the battle, which destroys the Americans. And then they're supposed to be used to mop up any Americans who try to escape. And you sit there and go, so basically you've got Yamoto and Mushashi going to sit there looking pretty and just fire their guns at one point. And these poor old pre-World War I designed upgraded battle cruisers are doing all the hard work. Because that is that, that is what they're going to be doing. In every single phase of the Kansai Kesson, the Congos have a role which you would define as critical quite important. to very uh, to quite important and yeah. they're some of the oldest ships they have actually was there even a plan for any replenishment at sea in the course well, of this because i can imagine that actually at, at least the war experience then showed that in a like running fight the battleships are going to spend quite a lot of ammunition for some hits no. so like how was that supposed to work okay the japanese there is an interesting di uh, di uh, dis mm, discussion that goes on and i have a good book which has quite a lot about it and i'll just grab it so i can show you okay so it is shokan hirohito's samurai and it's all the leaders of the Japanese Armed Forces, 1926-1945, written by a guy called Richard Fuller. It's published in 1992. It's very good. But when you read it, you will start to realize very quickly that there is a large, tro uh, there is a large crop of Japanese naval officers for whom logistics is something that happens to other people. And you realize there are some very good planners involved. But they're all talking about all sorts of things. At one point, they have ideas of having caches of fuel and explosives. Or, uh, well, fuel and weapons, etc. Hidden on various islands and secret bases. Another point, someone's talking about submarine rearmament for the ships. So apparently, they're going to have submarines which would go out and resupply the battleships. Please, they don't go into too much. But um, there are all sorts of little options considered. Ultimately, they knew they needed to do something. I don't think ultimately they had a solution of worked out of what to do till before 1941. I don't think they even had a solution of 1940 in 1941, to be honest. But yeah, I, I always mention when talking about these like pre-war plans that all these people, all the nations had is to like, you, you have to, uh, there is a certain air of unreality and perhaps ignoring some important details in everybody's plans. You know, on, on the Japanese side, it was, you know, supply and logistics and on, on other people's side, it was different stuff. Um, but on I think as you get, go ahead. I was going to say on the British side, you have the British army who thinks the Royal Navy is going to manage to get out to Singapore within three days. Which the Royal Navy is sitting there telling them, we're not going to get there for at least four to five weeks. The British Army is going, well, we can survive for 72 hours. We'd really <laughs> like you, you're the linchpin, you're supposed to survive for longer than 72 hours. We really need that hours to turn into <laughs> days, please. And then you've got the RAF who turns around, and this is why the RAF actually lose control of the fleet air arm. Is because they get invited. They're talking to Thomas Inskip, and they um, he's been uh, basically. There's a meeting which goes on, and the third Sea Lord has uh, suggested to him that he ask what the RAF's plan is for getting aircraft to the far to, uh, to the Far East for there are any operations in the Far East War. And Inskip goes, "Why is that important?" Uh, and basically, the first Sea Lord and the third Sea Lord who are there at the meeting go. This will explain why we want the fleet air arm back under the Royal Navy's control. Inskip asked them, and the RAF's response is, Well, 
Our, well, our first thing for any war is that first we will take all the fleet air arm aircraft off the, carrier, off the carriers, load them up with our aircraft, shuttle them out to Singapore, and then the carriers can come back to the UK to pick up the fleet air arm aircraft. Oh. At which point the, the, the things get asked, what happens to the fleet which doesn't have air cover at that time? And the RAF responds, well, well they'll survive. <laughs> they'll just have to stay in Singapore. Yeah. And <laughs> at which point, that's when the decision is made that the fleet air arm is going to belong to the Royal Navy from that point onwards. <laughs> and that decision is made in 1937. It's implemented in 1939. But... Uh. This is the thing, and oh, uh, don't get me started on some of the Royal Navy's ideas for uh, the Total War or the American. Or uh, everyone has problems, and every Navy, ha every yeah. service has problems in their plans. It's like the Army at one point doesn't in 1928, 29, when the Royal Navy is considering landing craft. The Army doesn't tell the Royal Navy they're just about to double the weight and the uh, and increase the width of their tanks. So the Royal Navy's trying to build a tank landing craft in the late 1920s, and the army doesn't tell them they're changing the weights and size of their tanks. Oops. Which possibly causes a, a, some naval constructors to go through the roof. Yeah. And uh, th that's, I mean, that, that was similar with the US as well, because like, a uh, landing craft that, can, uh, that was designed to fit a platoon of uh, M4 medium tanks suddenly can carry only one uh, M26 because it's just mm. not even that much heavier, but it just has a large footprint. That That's yeah. actually that, that's actually an interesting thing that I caught uh, when reading about the North Africa campaign, just uh, as a little side note that oh, a lot it, of it's... the problems with uh, like supplying the uh, Italian and uh, German troops in Africa was not really the tonnage, but just the military stuff is relatively light, but kind of like uh, voluminous. So it needs deck space, it needs uh, the uh, cubic meters. It doesn't really need that much in the. And the landing um, craft, of course, have to be flat bottom because uh, yeah. uh, pretty much flat bottom because they have to hit the beach and come off it, which doesn't make uh, it, it all adds fun. And it's I have to say though, it is the thing I'm waiting for. The fact that. Wargaming do World of Warships and World of Tanks. I'm waiting for the combined maps which have landing craft and tanks going ashore God, no, being supported no, no. by battleships and you could have a combined team matches and all those things going on. Just could be yeah. brilliant. Imagine it, the last tank left fighting and there's no more tanks left on their team. They're surrounded by the enemy and they but it turns out their na the navy side have actually done quite well so they can call in fire support oh. from some battleships. I, 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 <laughs> you're you're I mean, going to make we... people you're looking to make people real angry at CVs when they start sinking landing craft on the way to beaches and knock out a whole bunch of tanks. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we like to tease our World of Tanks colleagues by, by reminding them that uh, basically where their guns and our guns begin. So, like, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think that would work really well. <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, but yeah, I mean, with regards to the war plans, I, I kind of find the, the the American plan was probably the closest to reality, but only because it was very vague. It was like, okay, yep. so we will just like we we need this time to build fleet trains, so we will spend this amount of war basically doing nothing, and then we will have just have the numbers, and then like we don't care what they do. <laughs> And, you know, and also, you know, a lot of those war plans, like when we look at them today and think about them today, you know, so much they had so much inertia by the late 1930s of work that had been done over the previous 20 years that was all done in a world where air power from a naval perspective was totally different than what it would be in the late 1930s and into the 1940s. You know, that that ties into the battle cruiser conversation as well, because you know, by the time you get to the rearmament years of the 1930s, the fleet scouting sort of landscape looks a lot different than it did in 1912, 1913, 1914, in terms of aerial assets that, that can be used and and can scout huge areas where battle cruisers are, you know, much more limited. That's why you stop talking about the. <clears throat> oh, no. That's why you stop talking about a battle cruiser in many ways as your reconnaissance asset. 
because you start looking at cruisers to an extent with aircraft on them, but also the aircraft on your carriers. And let's be honest, a ship can be in one place and it can see as far as the eye can see. But an aircraft can see a lot further than the eye can see because it's a lot higher up. There is a question regarding that, actually. I'm now finding it. Ah, yeah, from Old Richard. Uh, at what range could a battlecruiser be spotted by a Blackburn Blackburn? Okay, I did maths on this one. <laughs> I remember this one because I did maths on it. Uh, I, I, I did actually do the, ma uh, do the maths for some sad reason. Let me just open it up. We uh, we can all be slightly worried that I did do the maths. <laughs> Uh, yes. Which question, which question number was it? Uh, it was uh, 96. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Blackburn Blackburn, whilst having a ceiling of 12,000 feet, tended to fly at around 3,000 feet when spotting. So, roughly, a radius of 72 miles or 62 nautical, nautical miles would be their maximum, their maximum range, which is not bad. Now, they could, of course, go slightly higher and see further. But they couldn't see them in as much detail. So that's the reality of it. Cool. But it's useful. Yeah. Uh, let's be honest, that is useful. Yes. And we can also worry about the obsession with Blackburn, Blackburn later. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, and uh, since we were talking... I, I, I should warn you, there are people on my channel who are starting a campaign to get the Blackburn, Blackburn into World of Wargaming. Oh, you might want to tell your colleagues that could be the, uh, the next thing, a scary thing coming their way. Uh, okay, I will. <laughs> I mean, we already got the HMS Incomparable coming, so uh, what's what's a little Blackburn, Blackburn? Mm -hmm. So, so um, I have to leave in a few minutes um, okay. due to other commitments, but I did want to ask the most important question um, uh, to Dr. Clark, and, and also I would like to answer, and that's one around... What was the prettiest battle cruiser to be um, sort of constructed? Uh, what was the most attractive looking battle cruiser? I think this is a really important question that I'd like to go on record about. Hmm. This is actually quite a difficult one because I would say of the pre World War One variety, it's definitely HMS Tiger because she is pretty. I, I, the German ones do have some very, how do I put this? The German ones have very gorgeous in functional lines and i would honestly compared to the rest of the british battle cruisers before the big cats mm, they definitely probably get there on the prettiness scale but tiger to me edges them on that prettiness scale but then comes along hms renown and especially refit renown i think is one of the prettiest ships the royal navy's ever had and i am not talking about hood here because honestly i don't find hood as pretty in any other form. Okay. And what is it so, for you? Uh, uh, I knew that me and Dr. Clark were going to agree on this one, which is why I wanted to talk about it before I left. And yes, HMS Renown is the correct answer for the most attractive battle cruiser. Um, but they all pair in, pale in comparison to the Queen Elizabeth battleships. So, you know, it's a very distant second place in terms of capital ship looks. I, I, I have to say, and this question, I'm kind of torn because I would love to say uh, the Congo, actually. But mm -hmm. I like the Congo in her fast battleship look with the Pagoda Tower and all. In the pre-refit, I, I, I don't know. I, That's the trouble, because uh, when she's yeah. a battle cruiser, I'd say no. But when she's a fast battle, uh, she's sort of, uh, she's theoretically a fast battleship, she does look very nice. Yeah. I, uh, so that's the sort of problem. It's the, it's the definition of the question. Yeah, in the like pure battle cruiser form, I would have to say it, I I'd probably go with the Derflinger. She's Are just you quite sure you want to say that. Yes, she just <laughs> has this like functional, like blocky Lego ship style. I, I I just like it. I don't really like the aesthetics of the. Newer German battleships like uh, the the Bismarcks, the Treble Twins. I I'm not really a fan, also because they all look the same for me. But uh, like the from from the classic battlecruisers, Derflinger. 
Uh, yeah. In any case, he has uh, that tripod mask. Well, yes, but she has that tripod mask just there. <laughs> just uh, sort of, you know, it's just there. I would agree, but just do something about the mask. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, in any case, I would uh, like to thank uh, Wesley for uh, stopping by with us. Uh, and uh, since we didn't have the time to properly plug in the channel at the beginning, now's the time. Sure. So, uh, you know, I'm Wesley Livesey. I'm the creator of the History of the Great War and the History of the Second World War podcasts. You can listen to both of them wherever podcasts are found. Um, currently doing a lot of interviews for History of the Great War and currently just about to start the Munich crisis here in a couple weeks on History of the Second World War. Wow, Munich crisis. Uh, I'm looking forward to the... Have the pleasure of, uh, we had the pleasure of actually recording a Oh, yes. Yeah. And I had an interview yeah, with... Dr. Clark, who you may have heard of, that should oh, be yeah. releasing in about 10 days. So Cool. Okay. I'll, oh. I'll make sure to uh, check both, but especially the Munich crisis, because I'm always interested in seeing this from like uh, external view, because uh, quite naturally in uh, my nation's history, this is kind of a uh, kind of sort of traumatic uh, experience, and uh, it's very would... like... I would like to pre-apologize then, because my pronunciation of Czech is uh, a little little iffy, uh, but I'll do it, my best. It, if you're, you're not as bad as lessons, my pronunciation of Japanese, so don't worry, you're yeah. probably good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you need some uh, coaching in the Czech pronunciation, I'm available. Noted. Okay, uh, have a uh, wonderful day, and thanks everybody for watching. Thank, uh, you. thank you for stopping by, and have a wonderful day as well. Uh, guys, go to the history of the second world war dot com and have fun. And you uh, will have fun. Yes. Uh, you so will it's have fun. Uh, now. Yes, you will have fun. That's an order. Uh, there was a question actually. Uh, oh, from Herafin. Now, uh, why doesn't Wesley Lifesay have a torpedo? Uh, that's because one didn't reach him yet. But uh, I, I think we will launch some that direction uh, yeah, sooner or later. He should have one. He should have yeah. one. Yes. To be fair, I, I, I'm now. It's now becoming quite a selling feature with my various academic colleagues to come on on armchair admirals for the idea of getting a a floppy torpedo. It's just it, it, it's causing quite a lot of love. Uh, from uh, my experience, what usually happens to the fluffy torpedoes is that they are appropriated by. Uh, whatever animal lives in the household and they are like taken away as a, a suitable cuddle slash chew toy so i i have kept mine away from the fluffy research assistants but it has taken effort yeah. it has taken effort yeah and uh yeah actually there was another question earlier in the chat what am i drinking so uh, i will do a little bit of product placement again I received a uh, supply from Great Britain, which is not fuel, so it uh, arrived. And uh, it's uh, Iron Brew, and uh, this was a by... Actually, I once tasted, tasting it, I realized that I had it once uh, before already, so it was a second experience. It didn't really improve, but, uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then again, uh, we have our own special soft drink that I probably should send uh, a sample of uh, the next time, the Kofola, and uh, it's uh, like, uh, yeah. Uh, will you ever put Turpillos for sale? Maybe. Uh, we had uh, actually, oh, damn it, we forgot about it, uh, but the... Uh, on the topic of battle cruisers, uh, actually uh, Wesley had a very good uh, summary of it uh, of it all. The battle cruiser is uh, not a category; it's a state of mind. That is definitely true, and it's definitely a state of mind in terms of the designer. It's the state of mind of the of the naval constructors and the architects who are working and looking at it. Because if you think about it, if you're building a fast battleship, you're still building something which is supposed to slug it out with battleships. If you're building a battle cruiser, you're building something which is supposed to be able to slug it out with cruisers and below, 
but they're supposed to be out able to outrun battleships and preferably other battle cruisers if you've got a chance. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> uh, oh, that, now I lost the question. I was. Uh... Oh, uh, DV Badger still didn't change my mind on Alaska being the best. Well, they they were the best uh, heavy cruisers or armored cruisers, if you will. They, and if you teleported one to 1914, they would be the best battle cruiser, definitely, yeah. hands down. That's the thing. The Alaska, if it was in 1914, would be the scare one of the scariest ships on the world. Even but if you 19... discount, yeah, if, if you discount the radar, everything new, still nine 12 inch guns. Yeah, with 33 that's gonna, knots. That's going to make a lot of people have a lot of very, very nasty um, panic attacks. But it's not... By the time it enters service, it's no longer that. And the other example I tend to give is that if we consider the Daring-class destroyers in that come out after World War II, they're near as nothing, makes no difference, almost 3,000 tons. Which means they are the size of light cruisers that were fought, oh, that fought in World War One. Yes. And that's uh, destroyers have grown to the size above them. Yeah. Uh, we have here a question uh, from the pre-recorded ones from uh, Tech Team 26. Uh, yeah. Would HMS Repulse have survived air attacks uh, that sank her if she had been refitted to the same configuration as her system, sister HMS Renown? Hmm. Ah, well, okay. There are two things that come into effect of that. One, does she get a more freedom of maneuvering? then she might have a chance. But honestly, the thing that would ultimately save them would have been having an aircraft carrier there to provide air defense. Even a small aircraft carrier, i.e. a first-generation armored carrier or something like that, illustrious class, with fighters that could break up the air attack would have given her a better chance. Because the problem you have when you're a ship is if the aircraft can concentrate on you, you're in trouble. If the aircraft can focus on you, you're in trouble. And if the aircraft can come at you in their full squadron formation, they can overwhelm your defenses because your defenses can't deal with being attacked from different angles at the same time. At one point, she's attacked from both sides by pretty much whole squadrons of aircraft. She can't deal with that. No air defense on no sh any ship at the time could have dealt with that. But if you have fighters to break up the attack, you are okay. So. Honestly, for Task Force, and I'm going to call them Task Force Z, because as I've said many times, Task Force Z sounds like Task Force C to me. It just sounds okay. weird. So I go with Task Force Z, which I know is the American and I'm British, but I'm, I'm doing that one. And if you want Task Force Z to survive, then you need to do, well, one of three things needs to happen. You either need Winston Churchill to actually realize aircraft carriers are useful for thing uh, for a lot of things, and therefore please do not stop them when you when you pause capital ship construction at the beginning of World War II, because he does that, and that causes a lot of problems, and it delays a lot of entry service entry dates. You need Ark Royal to have better damage control, and for them not to actually lose her, but you uh, for that and. On terms of those losses, you would need also, or maybe courageous or glorious not to get lost, i.e. one not to be used for anti-submarine warfare, because you really don't want to use a fleet carrier for that. It makes perfect sense, and later in the War of Escort Carriers, it does great guns, but using a fleet carrier for it, just because it's all you have available, does not make it sensible. And glorious, frankly, shouldn't have been going off on her own without an air scout and out proper protection. So any of those three ships don't get lost, Task Force Z has air cover. It's a set, or if any of the aircraft carriers get built on time, Tarsal said has air cover. And finally, if illustrious and formidable don't get damaged in the Mediterranean, Tarsal said probably has air cover. Any one of those scenarios, something works out. They have fight. They have a carrier. They have fighter protection. The, the air attacks probably get broken up. And they probably can withdraw. With their own air defences, etc. They probably have enough. They can withdraw. And that's what they would have done. The fighters would have broken up. They'd have probably coordinated with land based air. Because the, air, the controllers on the carrier could have done that. Coordinated with the land based aircraft. Which they were in range of allied supporting land based aircraft. And the aircraft could have come in. They could have maybe considered 
fighting on, if you consider Phillips, his personality, he might have considered trying to fight on and then might have gone down differently, or he might have withdrawn. In which case, you have a very different scenario taking place a few days later or a few weeks later when ABDA command is formed, because it might be formed up around Tom Phillips and Rep Rep HMS Repulse, HMS Prince of Wales, and whatever aircraft carrier is there. And suddenly that becomes a far more scary force. So yeah. ultimately, yes, if she had a refit, she would have probably done slightly better. But she'd have probably still been lost. The thing that would have saved them is any of the decisions at the beginning of the war actually not being done, actually being done any of so slightly differently. Uh, the, actually, my take on this would be probably a bit uh, heretical. Uh, but, uh, well, one one problem, obviously, that, that uh, no matter how uh, improved she would be, uh, there is a note, actually, with this question from Wesley, that the presence of Prince of Wales and its similar fate seems to point to the lack of modernization effort not being a decisive factor. And I have to agree, because mm. if your modern anti-aircraft suit is on the actual target, it has a very hard time doing anything. It's basically the midway situation where like 60% of Japanese AA firepower was on the aircraft carriers themselves and uh, their escorts can't really contribute because they were either far away or uh, in the case of the plane guard destroyers, they had just basically point defense weapons. They had just the 25 mm. millimeter guns and they couldn't really help in any way they they couldn't even help themselves where they when they were attacked so if uh, both of the four z ships are uh, improved uh, both of the battleships they don't really that doesn't really change that much because by the time their anti-aircraft guns get into action it's generally already too late and they are the main target so everyone is going at them and apart from like attacks from multiple directions being uh, kind of uh, difficult to deal with being attacked is a as a nick moran would say is a strong emotional moment so it lowers the efficiency of the of even the best anti-aircraft groups, groups let's be honest like you always yeah, have that little nibbling thing going especially since it always looks like the aircraft is going straight for you right so it always uh, does. Okay. Yeah. And, but it does. There's been an interesting thing come into the um, YouTube chat, which is Skipper S has come and said, has said well, that would be two RNCBs versus the Kido Batai in the Java Sea in that scenario. It might actually not be, because if you consider if the British have Renau, uh, have Repulse and Prince of Wales, maybe have a carrier, maybe have a couple of carriers. You might end up with a sort of Java Sea version of the Midway Coral Sea battles, where but also with the American carriers coming in. Because if there's a significant British fleet there, and there's a significant American fleet there, but neither of them are strong enough really on their own to take out the Japanese, they might well combine. And you could have a very interesting scenario of maybe three American carriers, a single one or two British carriers, especially with the British having fast, basically fast capital ships that can escort them. Because one of the things that worries the Americans in their deployment of their ships is they don't have the fast capital ships to escort their carriers. It makes them very worried about deploying them. And, and uh, also the British, the presence of the British fast capital ships themselves would also have effect on the Japanese operations. Because if there's a fast capital ship and carrier force down in the Southeast Asia, you're not going to want to send a small force. So these things would have had an impact, but it all goes to the whole, you know, the whole operation needs to be figured. It's a, something which would be quite interesting to war game. Uh, uh, used in some, yes. You know, to, to go through and work it out because how the Japanese would respond and how the Americans and the British respond and how the Allies end up working together could have a very big impact on the course of the war. Yes, uh, uh, agreed, especially since like, you have to consider it by the time uh, the Java Sea was happening, the US Navy was close to uh, uh, launching their own raids on the Japanese outposts mm. on the other side of the Pacific uh, theater. So even if they didn't actually join the British in the Dutch East Indies, the 
Kidabutai would be hard pressed to stay in one piece if you have uh, British careers here and uh, American careers here. It's doing probably their broke stuff. up, spreading up, and yeah. doing its stuff, and it is, and then that changes the scenario. Yes, and uh, then you have but, of course the British, uh, the British productivity for night strikes, and their experience in the Mediterranean, etc. And suddenly you could have a very, very well. It could go either way. If the Japanese catch them during the day, they can probably overwhelm the numbers. But if the British catch them at night, they might even the score or take out enough that that means even in a daytime fight, they have a good shot. Yeah, but uh, one heretical thought that uh, just to finish it off, I think that far more useful for the for Z would be having actually destroyers with dual purpose main battery and modern anti-aircraft fire control, because in the event of the air attack the destroyers are not the target they are further away so they can start shooting earlier and the heavy anti-aircraft fire is not good for proper medium bomber formations which the japanese and needed to have the i mean there's a case from the pq-17 convoy when a single destroyer destroyer basically disrupted half of the torpedo bomber attack because the skipper didn't want to wait for them to come so he kind of charged against yeah, the an, bombers the, the, that's... there's an example of hms gurkha which went down charging and driving off an air attack on a convoy um there have been lots of examples of destroyers being used but again that's another re reason to say if you'd had a carrier there because if you'd had a yeah. carrier there the british would have probably sent uh, sent some of their newer destroyers because again it's going to sound strange, but even at this point, there was a realization of British command that carriers were very, very useful and very important, and you protected them. And the thing was, the carrier there was a carrier supposed to be sent out to force it. There was a carrier supposed to be with it. They were being delayed. They were interrupted. All sorts of things. But the reason the Royal Navy can quickly put carriers into the Eastern Fleet and create the Eastern Fleet when they do, it's because those forces were already allocated to go out to the Far East and were being sort of shuffled in that direction slowly anyway. They just thought they had more time and they were dealing with other things. They were fighting a war in the Mediterranean and Atlantic at the time and so they were trying to juggle everything. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's time slowly to uh, wrap up, but... Uh... Uh, there is a question from uh, Jonathan Tubes, which is, I mean, uh, what are the most famous German battlecruiser class of World War II? Which is, I mean, kind of like uh, there were no uh, German battlecruisers of uh, World War II because the terrible twins were uh, actually small battleships. But Kriegsmarine had battlecruiser projects. They did. It's uh, basically they had. Uh, they were again doing a very very. Uh, weird uh, sort of things they had a, a mm. p-class cruiser project which was basically the Panzerschiffe on uh, steroids that's uh, uh, basically same armament of six 28 centimeter guns but better guns and mm -hmm. in the different layout uh, but uh, then uh, based on them there was a proposal for the o-class battle cruisers which would have uh, 38 centimeter guns even though they would share a lot of uh, common things. So it's debatable whether they would really rate a proper battle cruiser, but Kriegsmarine wanted to use them as They're such. Battle so... cruisers, that's what they were going to planning on building. Yeah. And honestly, it's one of the things you sort of sit there and go, if the, the, it's the treaties that in many ways robbed us of this. Because if the treaties had been either become defunct in the nineteen early 1930s, or had been put in later than 1920, then you'd probably have seen far more battle cruisers around. You'd have certainly seen the American Lexingtons. And mm. honestly, I can't see them ending the battleship hold there and going, you know what? We're yeah. not going to build any more of these. They would probably have built more battle cruisers. And that would yeah. have been a really interesting thing, what the Americans would have built as their follow on class of battle cruisers to the Lexingtons. Well, I, I actually, I think that even without the treaties, uh, the money would run out uh, eventually with the Great Crisis, so the follow-up would probably be uh, end up being uh, fast battleships anyway, but uh, uh, I, I mean, in any case, you have well, Lexington. Money so... doesn't always run out. There are ways around money yeah, running. True, out. true, but uh, yeah. 
but uh, Especially you, when you're a dictatorship, you, have... you can get around these things. <laughs> you have at least two uh, Lexingtons. You have at least two Amagis. Uh, mm -hmm. You have the admirals. Probably the, the admirals get uh, the admirals. You probably get about two of them, and you probably get two more converted to carriers because they were looking at that. Yeah. And if it hadn't been for the treaties, it def the uh, the Washington Treaty, I could certainly see two out of two of the admirals being completed as aircraft mm -hmm. carriers. Because yeah, and, uh, then th that would have made more sense to the British because they were thinking about that. Because honestly, Furious was a bit already a bit worrying at that point. So the idea would have been to have two admirals and two again, courageous and glorious as the core of your future carry as your of your 1920s carrier fleet. Yeah, and uh, that would uh, that would of course influence the French and the Italians, even though it's hard to say what. What more they can actually Well, the do French because... might actually build a decent aircraft carrier, and they might sort of... Yeah. Oh, it seems we lost uh, Dr. Clark again. Uh, where is the mouse for this computer? And I'm back. Hello. Yes, you are back. <laughs> I don't um... know what keeps happening. Uh, okay, we are still not uh, seeing you. Hello. No, it's loading. I'm back. Ah, yes, you are back even in uh, in image. Yay! Yay! <laughs> but no, it, it, you know the French might have actually built something. And this is the other interesting thing: the French were considering battle cruisers at some point, and if they'd actually had one under construction, they might have gone with that rather than burn, which could have given them a better a better carrier. Because let's be honest, battle cruisers are actually a better th starting point for an aircraft carrier construction than a battleship because they tend to be longer and faster <laughs> yeah which i i mean even the... which you need for an aircraft carrier yeah i, I mean even the japanese found it and uh, kaga was uh, basically Kag kaga if we uh, or tosa class if finished as a battleship would probably fit mm. the fast battleship bill because kaga was able to do what 28 knots yes but still she was Sailing in the same fleet with the 33 knots Akagi and the 35 knots uh, Suryu and Hiryu, so that uh, also caused a lot of problems at Midway. It's probably also helped to her being hit the hardest, actually, because the slower the target, the easier the aim. But uh, in any case, uh, so yeah, battle cruisers definitely would be better than battleship, especially than Bearn. That's and, uh, and of course, I mean, we might have also got the Soviet battle cruisers. You never know. They all, though, they almost that that's the great battle cruiser class, which is which I think would have had the most imp strategic impact on the world that wasn't built, and that's the Borodino class battle cruisers that yes. the Soviets uh, that Russians were building. And I think if the Russians had got the Borodinos into service, I could see them being a factor a factor in the 1939 Russo-Japanese War. I could see the Russians using them, especially if they managed to keep them maintained and going um, as a factor in that. And I could therefore seeing that either revealing Japanese capabilities, which would make the Americans and Brits rethink what exactly they'd be facing with the Japanese. Or if they stay in, if they survive, then they become a problem for the Germans and possibly potentially even the Italians. Because if mm. they're in the Black Sea fleet, then those ships come out and join up with the uh, possibly come through the uh, well past Constantinople and come out to say hi. Well, I'm I'm not sure about not that, enough. but I, I I mean they were designed primarily for the Black Sea, right? So they were primarily for the Black Sea, but they would have probably been elsewhere as well. Yeah, yeah, but uh, they would definitely make uh, life very hard for. Uh, all the minor Axis uh, navies in the in the area because uh, Ooh, they like mop them all up. The, the, yeah. There would have been nothing left. Yeah, to fight like if, uh, to fight against them. Yeah, if if your largest uh, surface unit is a large destroyer and the Soviets have a battle cruiser, if if it's in a good enough condition to sail, then you have a big pile of trouble, and it would also influence uh, stuff like Siege of Sevastopol because. Okay, hey, mobile uh, artillery on the sea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it probably it won't uh, won't influence it that much, but it would definitely slow uh, the advance down, and that would have more. Like uh, it, it's like with everything in history, every every little change can have a large pile-on effect down the line because 
I mean, just look at uh, what effect was uh, that uh, Germany first had to help Italy in Greece before going to Soviet Union. Hmm. And then Italy <coughs> had to pull Germany's um, bonds out of the oven uh, when they were in Crete, because if the yes. Italians hadn't shown up, then the Germans in Crete might have ended up losing. And that yep. could have changed. It could change our appreciation of history. Yes, definitely. Uh, Vice Admiral Luffy, you don't need a twenty-seven knot battle cruiser in the Black Sea. And I, I, I would argue that uh, in small sea the speed might be even more important because it allows you to basically just take the Guadalcanal scenario. It allows you to get in and out under the cover of darkness, mm. for example. Yeah. That's uh, that's why the Congos were used at Guadalcanal and uh, not uh, heavier units because the Congos can actually get out of the strike range of the aircraft before the before the mm. sunrise, which is kind of useful. Yes. Yeah. And let's be honest, if you can do a quick rush raid, that gives you a lot of a lot of potential power if you are the Soviet Union. Uh, yeah. And they were, if ever, I know we are talking about battle cruisers because battle cruisers are coming into world of warships, but it, you know it, it gives you a starting point for the Soviet warship uh, battle cruiser line, the Borodino class. Oh, we have the Borodino already in the game, uh, yeah, separately. It, it's a, I, it's I a know. fun little thing. It it looks funny. It's like. Yeah, I, I think it. Uh, I actually like it. It's the starting than... point of their battle yeah. cruiser line, really. Yeah, I, I I like it probably more than Dunkirk aesthetics wise because it's just like tiny and cute. <laughs> the Dunkirk is already big, but uh, in any case, it uh, unlike reinforces... the incomparable, which apparently, which according to the person uh, Drac who keeps hosting, he's saying it's so big it can't fit on the screen. Uh, I'm actually looking at it right now in port, and yes, it cannot. It's 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 just uh, yeah it, it's uh... it's a true Jackie Fisher ship. It's so yes. big it can't even fit in a picture. Yeah, if, if it was uh, somewhat smaller, it would be cute. This way, it's just huge. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's like if you imagine a like a corgi twice the size of a corgi. Uh, in any case, uh, I think this is it for today. Actually, because. Uh... It's already uh, getting close to a half past. Uh, so, I mean, uh, final statement on Battlecruiser. Okay, the final Good statement. Good idea, bad have... idea. Ooh. Okay, idea. Uh, Battlecruisers are a good idea, but the first thing, the final statement which you should always take away, is it's two words. Battle Cruiser. Not one word. That's how they originally designed it, because this was another generation of cruiser. So it was like scout cruiser, light cruiser, heavy cruiser, torpedo cruiser, armor cruiser, battle cruiser. And the reason it's given battle cruiser as its name is because of partially Jackie Fisher trying to sell it to everyone, but also because that's the level he's going for. He's going for a battleship level guns, as in dreadnought battleship level guns, on a cr in a cruiser form for cruiser duties. It's supposed to be, as always had been, the largest cruiser was supposed to be big enough that it could outrun anything it could and outfight, and outfight anything it could and outrun. And that was its role. And that's what you're really looking at when you're looking for a battle cruiser. And that's your test of whether something is a battle cruiser. Is it designed as a battle cruiser in the mind of the designers? That's the first question. Which is why the Iowas probably aren't battle cruisers, but there's an argument, as said. And is it able to fulfill that function of at the equivalent ships of its time is it able to outrun those it can't outfight is it able to outfight those it can't outrun and if it fits those three criteria if it's designed as battle cruiser by its designers if it can outrun what it can't outfight and it can outfight what it can't can't or can out can't outrun it's probably a battle cruiser probably yeah. he says because okay, there are some other ones which are sort of mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, thanks for the final summary. And uh, this is the time when we can uh, plug in uh, what's up uh, on your channel. What's coming up on your channel? Oh, what's coming up? I've just done the Dreadnought a day. 
which was all the 2nd of October, which are free lives which are up there. I'm still trying to get to 13,000 subscribers by December 31st so that my I, I win my bet with my aunt. And um, currently, what have we got coming up this week? We've got a monitor uh, being discussed, the Erebus class. We have got the Battle of Kentish Knock on Friday. One of the most interestingly named battles ever, because it's called Kentish Knock. And that's actually going to be alive on Friday, and we've got brew ships on Sunday. So you know, it's quite a it's quite a calm week for me after last week's, which was um, lives Thursday, lives for uh, Saturday, free lives on Saturday, and then Sunday, and then today. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I drank I, I I drank so much Iron Brew over the weekend. I am surprised I'm not glowing orange. Uh, and uh, I've noticed also that you started a. Uh... A new series of videos, like uh, very short yeah, ones. Yeah, I've started the 67, a uh, 60 second short series because I saw all these scientists doing science stuff in 60 seconds and I went, I can do history stuff in 60 seconds. So I have, <laughs> I'm giving it a go. And I have even managed to use the fluffy torpedo in a couple yep, of them. I, uh, I, I saw it. Uh, it. I have to admit, it, we're talking about canines and fluffy creatures take it actually this one has had holes in it from me because i stuck some i used the needle and cotton to show how aerial torpedoes were kept level we using a tension wire when they were going down in oh. a 60 second video okay i missed that one so uh, definitely going to uh <laughs> check that one out <laughs> Yeah, I saw basically, I, some... I adapted it to an aerial torpedo. <laughs> well, I, I mean, it has kind of proportions closer to the Mark 13 than to... Mm -hmm. uh, it, cool. It's closer to the Mark 13 than the Mark 14. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, guys, if you didn't see those short videos yet, they are extremely fun. Go to uh, AC Naval History on YouTube and watch them because yeah they are they are fun they are short they are easy uh, you can sneak them in uh, even in the middle of meeting and stuff uh, so yeah they are fun and uh, of course watch also the longer uh, more <laughs> uh, more uh, intense videos but uh, 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 well I don't I, I think I do the longer more intense ones could probably describe the long patrol ones I'm never sure if my lives could ever be called longer intense they are usually done conversational seminar style yeah true <laughs> yeah uh, yeah oh. and uh, uh, see you at the, around at the next uh, armchair animals which actually will have a very unusual topic uh, because uh, it's October uh, there is a Trafalgar Day incoming, and we think it will be fun to talk about the era that basically kickstarted a lot of the things that then dragged in into the world wars, including the Mayhem Doctrine and stuff. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the uh, British uh, take on Kantaikesen in the period of the sailing ships on the Battle of It'll Trafalgar. Yes, it will be fun. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, uh, see you around uh, next time Take we care. are talking uh, sailing ships. So, Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. And uh, thank thanks everyone for uh, stopping by, for watching, and for uh, lively interaction in the chat, and for a lot of the questions. Uh, I hope we managed to answer some of the questions. I've noticed that uh, we didn't manage to convince DV Badger that the uh, Alaskas were not uh, uh, battle cruisers, but uh, well, we tried. <laughs> Have fun and uh, see you around next time. Bye bye.